thank you all very, very much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, just as an aside, if anyone has, there's no one to, to testify this afternoon for the one public hearing that we have, so we're going to go right into that public hearing. And this is a um, agenda item number six, spending affordability guidelines for FY21 operating budget. It's going to go before the GO Committee work session, which is tentatively scheduled for February 6, 2020, and there are no speakers for this hearing. The next item that we're going to have, and that closes our public hearings, the next item that we're going to have is a briefing on Vision Zero Plan on Pedestrian and Bicycle Safety, and I'd like to ask Dr. Glenn Orland to please uh, explain that to us. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yes, I'll keep my comments short. Uh, we have about an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes uh, for this briefing. We asked for it about a week and a half ago. Um, you should have in front of you five pieces of paper, the packet that went out last Thursday, the addendum that was circulated this morning, and three PowerPoint presentations, one from the, um, uh, the new permanent um, Vision Zero coordinator, Wade Holland, one from Tim Smith, uh, the Acting State Highway Administrator, and one from uh, the planning staff um, having to do with their program, and Jason Sartori will be speaking about that. Uh, we have four presenters for you today, um, taking up hopefully about the first half hour. Uh, Tim, who, Tim Smith, who's the acting state highway administrator, will go first. Uh, Wade Holland, the now permanent uh, Vision Zero coordinator, will, be, will follow him. Uh, Jason Sartori, speaking for the planning staff and planning board, will be here, although I see Casey Anderson is here as well. And finally, Christy Daphnis, the chair of the Pedestrian Safety, Pedestrian Bicycle and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee. Uh, we intend that to be followed by up to an hour of Q&A amongst the council and the, and the staffs. And by the staffs, there's a whole host of other folks here who recognize as being part of the program. Uh, we have um, uh, Chris Conk from DOT. We have um, uh, Captain Didone, Tom Didone from the police department. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, folks from MCPS, um, other folks from State Highway Administration, so, and, and the, the names are all in your packet. So with that, I'd ask uh, the four speakers to come up to the witness table, uh, Tim Smith, Wade Holland, Jason Sartori, and Christy Daphnis. And uh, the first PowerPoint is queued up for State Highway, so uh, Samantha Biddle with State Highway is going to run that for, uh, for Tim. Well, good afternoon, and thank you all for being here with us. And we're going to ask you to please begin from, what did you say, from State Highway first? From State Highway, please. Good, if you can touch, yeah, there we go. Good afternoon. Um, oh, so you're very um, electrifying. I, mean, uh, yes. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, my name is Tim Smith. I'm MDOT State Highway Administration's Deputy Administrator for our, and Chief Engineer for Operations. Uh, Greg asked me to step in to be acting, so I'm kind of wearing two hats at the same time right now. Um, I guess what I wanted to kind of go over today was give you an update. I know he came and spoke to this body in November, I believe, and just give you an update on our progress since then, kind of, and uh, also just to kind of briefly introduce myself a little bit, is uh, I came up through uh, the materials ranks a little bit, so I was the engineer, so I've been very used to implementing innovative and new ideas uh, and had to navigate change a little bit, so this is actually fortuitous to kind of be in this role. Um, Greg kind of set the stage for us, and now we got to kind of go in there and implement it. Um, like I said, I'm going to stay at a kind of high level because I'm all of two weeks into this position. But uh, I have uh, Andre Futrell, Erica Rigby, um, Derek Gunn, and Christopher Bishop, and Samantha Biddle here to kind of guide me through any questions on details. So the three things I kind of wanted to go over today, like I said, is kind of give you an update on our context guide, what we've done since November, as well as uh, mentioning what implementation we've done in these last two months, and then kind of give you an update on where we got for progress over the next, um, in the future. So as far as what we've done the last two months, we've definitely been soliciting feedback. Uh, that, the, that was kind of unveiling when uh, Greg mentioned it in November. So we've gotten a lot of good feedback. Uh, I've been out on the, the on the beat a little bit, uh, presenting it at several different locations. We presented at MDQI last week. I know uh, my peer, uh, Deputy Administrator Jason Ridgway, presented it at the ASCE conference. Um, but given this is going to kind of fundamentally change how we do our designs, uh, planning, and construction and maintenance of our roadways, we really want to get out and get everyone's feedback. And we've obviously shared it with Montgomery County and, and gotten feedback on that. 
Um, we've also been to several community meetings, both in Silver Spring and with uh, Council Member Glass with the Vision Zero back in December. So some feedback we've gotten already over the last two months when we've had it open is just kind of clarifying some interagency coordination. We're realizing uh, we're going to have to coordinate with both the locals and municipalities, especially when we have intersections. Uh, kind of ch pri trying to prioritize our resources available and where we, where we have our, our needs, and we're de tr definitely trying to make that a data-driven uh, decision. Uh, we obviously have gotten some feedback on work zones and just how to navigate and uh, pedestrian accessibility in work zones. And in addition to that, uh, those related to developers. So a lot of times we'll issue permits for on state highway roadways, and we gotta, we got to make sure we have that covered in our guide as well as we move forward. And then finally, just kind of re resolving some of those connectivities between locals and, and the state roads. So part of what my previous job as chief engineer was, was kind of implementing some of these changes. So the, back in the spring, I met with all our districts across the state, our district engineers, and kind of laid out the groundwork before this was kind of fully baked, um, before Greg was able to launch it in November. So what we kind of focused on was four main things, was reduced speed limits, uh, continental striping where we were replacing existing crosswalks, new turn on red where it was appropriate, as well as leading pedestrian interval. And what the goal there was to kind of modify the environment that a lot of our users are in to try to create a safer, uh, more accessible environment for all the users. So just kind of highlighting some of those uh, updates we've done is when Greg was here in November, he highlighted that we, we touched eight different corridors. One additional one where we've lowered the speed limit is on Maryland 193 through the purple line. So we've reduced that speed limit since then. And just to kind of give you some context, for the, for the zone A, that's a 25 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, urban center is 30 miles an hour and suburban activity center is 35 miles an hour. In addition to that, we've, put, we've done some additional uh, improvements at crosswalks. We've done the continental striping at all the crosswalks you see on the screen here. In addition to that, uh, we've a, installed a no turn on red at three, on the 355 at Marianelli Road. Signal improvements. We've done several signal improvements since November, one of which uh, is at Maryland 97 at May Street. We have added a traffic signal as well as a pedestrian signal at that location. And we are also looking at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we also did upgrades at Maryland 355 and Church Street and Maryland 355 at Park Road. We've added accessible pedestrian signal and countdown at those locations. Um, plan for next month is we're rolling out some um, lead pedestrian interval. Um, just to give you some context there, that basically when it goes green, it gives the pedestrians the right of way to get into the crosswalk before any of the, the, the vehicles can start to move. So gives you three to seven seconds to get everyone into the crosswalk and kind of ind indicate to uh, vehicles that there's people in the crosswalk before they start going. So we're, that's planned on being out in 2020, I'm sorry, February 2020 at Maryland 355 at Park Road and Maryland 586 at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Atlantic Avenue. So in addition to those improvements, we have several ongoing studies, but I kind of wanted to just touch base real quickly on and just mention the, the, the three recent tragedies in, in Montgomery County and those at, at several locations. And I kind of wanted to brief you on kind of what the district does when we, we run into those type of situations. So one of the biggest things we need is just kind of, we initially do a site assessment and what we're doing there is we're looking at uh, existing conditions in terms of uh, lighting, signals, signs, pavement markings, um, and site, line of sight, um, as well as we'll get information and, and, and contributing factors from the police report. So we're gathering all that information along with vehicle counts and pedestrian counts with those particular locations and gathering all that data to make better decisions. Um, so in addition to that, we have corridors under study right now. One of those is 355 in Bethesda. I know the District 3 team led by Andre and Erica and uh, Derek met with the community members um, in since November and they've developed several pedestrian safety plans for the downtown area of Bethesda. In addition to that, I know they 
They met in February, I'm sorry, in um, Friday of December 13th with the community in Bethesda, looked at the Maryland 187 and did a, a kind of a walk through with the community with that and identified several safety improvements. We wanted to really get the feedback from the community before in, in installing or implementing any improvements. In addition to that, uh, they made some improvements along that corridor in terms of just addressing some curbs, uh, removing some debris, removing some things that didn't need to be in uh, the sidewalk area to try to improve safety. In addition to that, they have several other ongoing uh, items that in just in the interest of time, I'm just going to not go into details about that, but I'll, I'll address them in questions if, if it comes up. So just moving forward, we've made some progress, but we have significant progress still to be made. Um, and I just kind of wanted to make a commitment. I know Greg started this with you all, uh, and I think he had a, a, at least a very good working relationship with every one of you. I want to continue that relationship, and you have my commitment to move, keeping this at the forefront. Um, we're going to continue with our education and outreach because a lot of that belongs. We're reaching out to our industry members now, like a lot of our A&E, our, our engineering firms. So we need to make sure they're comfortable with that, especially when we're doing um, uh, developers or, or producing these. Uh, we're looking for opportunities for doing proactive treatments. So anytime we're touching a roadway, I know I've given that direction out to all the districts that when we're doing resurfacing, we're going to be replacing with continental striping, looking for opportunities to reduce speeds. Those four main proactive items that I mentioned earlier. And overall, we're looking just to develop an action plan that I'm getting from each of the districts, um, including District 3, which includes Montgomery and um, <coughs> Prince George's County. But we're going to be incorporating that into our planning and design process. So we're, we're kind of looking through everything with a different lens now to make sure we're designing it and planning it properly. But then also when we're implementing, more on my side, we're making sure we're implementing things that help improve safety on all our state roadways. So I guess what I kind of wanted to summarize here, we're just looking, we're, we're, we're using data driven. Uh, we're definitely looking at a different way of doing our context guide. Uh, like I said, I'm very big on implementing new ideas and implementing them, navigating change. And every time we implement something new that we have to navigate some change. But we're looking for safe, high quality, and efficient opportunities to improve safety in Montgomery County. So thank you. Thank you very much. The next presenter, please. Well, Glenn, excuse me. While Glenn's getting the slides ready, uh, let me reintroduce myself. I've presented in front of you a couple times in the past about Vision Zero, but um, as of Monday, I became the full-time Vision Zero coordinator for, for uh, Montgomery County. So, uh, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that I actually thought about, you know, having experience with this program, a lot of people would say, you know, oh, there's nothing but headaches. Run the other way. Don't don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, but working with our community partners, state partners, and and our county employees. Um, they're all very driven and committed to making Vision Zero a reality in this county, so I wanted to, you know, keep working with everyone and making sure that we can uh, make this all a safer place to live, work, and play. Um, so my presentation, I'll be giving you kind of an update where we are in terms of serious and fatal collisions. Um, recent activity we completed since we last met in, in November, and an overview of our kind of 2020 work plan. So kind of first slide, make sure we just talk about our partners. Um, Vision Zero is impossible without partners. Um, every time we update this slide, we have more and more people added to the list. So we have about 22 partners listed there. And these are really just kind of government and nonprofit partners that we work with directly. Um, so include community groups that we are going to work with more in the, in the future. It's, uh, there won't be enough uh, boxes on the slides to really go with that. So quick look at crash statistics. So if you remember in the two-year action plan, we had set a goal of a 35% reduction in serious and fatal collisions. Uh, compared to the five year, so 2012 to 2016 average. As you can see in 2019, um, we met our targets um, for motor vehicle occupants, so that's drivers, passengers. Um, it's 176 was the actual. Again, these are all in red because these are preliminary figures. It takes sometimes a whole quarter to finalize all the numbers from the year prior. So these may adjust over time, but this is where we're at as of right now. Um, for pedestrians, we're well above the target, uh, missing the target. The target was 49, and we had 78 for um, 2019, and then we matched the target for 11 and 11 for bicyclists. So the overall target was 240 um, serious and fatal crashes, and we actually had um, 265. 
Uh, to give you an idea, so compared to the overall target, we had a reduction of 28%. The target was 35%. Um, so clearly we have more work to do, and especially with the pedestrian numbers um, going up, we're gonna, we have more focus to do on our pedestrian safety. Um, year to date, of course, we've had three fatalities in January. Um, for serious collisions, we've had one cyclist, uh, nine motor vehicle occupants, and three pedestrians. Um, including all pedestrian bikes, we've had about 36 pedestrians and six cyclists struck. Um, that's for all injury levels. Uh, to give you an idea, January is one of our most dangerous months for pedestrians and bicyclists, or actually, sorry, for pedestrians. Um, in January, you're having over between 36 and 52 pedestrians struck in the month of January. So taking a look at our fatal crashes, this goes between 2005 and 2019. Again, 2019 numbers are preliminary. Um, so in 2018, for motor vehicle occupants, we had our, um, you know, a decade's low number of uh, 13, 13 fatalities. Uh, we went up to 17 in 2019. We're still studying that 17 and seeing if, what, if any differences there were between the two years. Pedestrians is kind of stable. We had 14 pedestrian fatalities in 2018 and then 13 in 2019 and one cyclist fatality in 2019. And to kind of put these numbers in perspective, uh, Glenn can go back a second. No problem. Um, you know, during this time, we've been kind of holding steady with our fatality numbers right around 30 for the last uh, decade or so. Um, within that time, since 2015, our population has grown about 15%, or we're basically added over 100,000 people. Um, vehicle miles traveled has gone up 4%. So while we're seeing more exposure, because more people um, more driving, uh, cheaper gas. We're actually kind of holding steady on our numbers, but of course, these not vision holds steady, it's vision zero. So um, while we're not seeing the increase that we're seeing nationwide in other areas, we know that we can do better. So let you know what we've done since November. Um, we did release our 2020 work plan uh, on uh, Monday, yesterday. Uh, it has 32 action items that will be completed in the year 2020. We hired the Vision Zero coordinator. Uh, that was also announced yesterday. We activated a Hawk beacon uh, at Tuckerman Lane and Bethesda Trolley Trail. That was an upgrade from an existing pedestrian beacon. Uh, we had the Holiday Task Force, which runs from mid-November through New Year's Eve, and they arrested and removed 288 impaired drivers from our road. Mm -hmm. And that was just the task force itself. Mm -hmm. So that actually doesn't include all the DUIs drivers that were captured during that time. Mm -hmm. um, still way too many people, given all the options that we have. And we do want to remind folks that because we do have the Super Bowl Sunday coming up, there's a lot of drunk driving. Almost half of all fatalities that happen on Super Bowl weekend are drunk driving nationwide. So um, hopefully find a safe ride home or Dydon will give you one, but his, his Uber is much more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, we also had additional about 10,000 contacts with residents uh, through our Be Safe Be Seen campaign that we had last fall. And we've also been piloting a central traffic unit for high visibility enforcement in our central traffic unit uh, in police. So you'll be getting more details in uh, committee meetings uh, in the next month about our CIP recommendations. But overall, we've identified $266.6 million for Vision Zero related projects in the CE's recommended uh, capital improvements budget over this next six years. That includes 26 pedestrian and bikeway projects. And we have Vision Zero Principles incorporated into 16 road and bridge projects. So there may be road and bridge under the categories, but there may be sidewalks or uh, bike lanes that are included in the project. So all that 266.6 million, 24 million of it is actually additional funding for Vision Zero projects. That includes 9.3 million additional for the pedestrian safety uh, projects, 4.5 million for our purple line um, bicycle pedestrian priority area, allowing us to start that project a year earlier than we had uh, in the last CIP, and additional funds for you know, filling sidewalks uh, and other bikeway projects as well. So our 2020 work plan, uh, again, 32 action items. Uh, you can skip this slide, actually. Uh, sorry, one, one after this. Get the other way. So our 2020 action plan and, and work plan is really kind of an extension of our two-year action plan that wrapped up in 2019. So we're still using the same uh, five areas of engineering, education, and enforcement, um, traffic incident management, law policy, and advocacy. And then really the goals of the 2020 action plan is we had a lot of things that were under study and design there in the 2018-2019 work plan. So now we're actually going to implement these studies and you know, start construction on many of these areas. 
Um, the county executive on Monday challenged us to, even be, to go beyond this work plan that we've delivered to find more quick fixes and more opportunities. Um, for example, using flex posts or other means to make uh, the turning radius wider so people turn slower so they can see pedestrians and if they are going slower, more likely to stop. And obviously more engagement. We've, we've done quite a bit of an engagement in the last two years, but now with the full-time coordinator and um, other people that come online the last two years, we can do even more community engagement than we've done in the past. Um, so for their engineering items, again, a lot of these are designed for, you know, what are we going to actually do all along our high injury network? If you remember in the tier action plan, we identify kind of top 10 county maintain and top 10 state maintain corridors. So in the two year, act, or sorry, in the 2020 action plan, we'll be doing work on six out of the 10. We'll have some sort of construction or design undergoing. Um, and also as we look forward to the 10 year strategy, we're also looking at developing planning and planning cost estimates for a whole build out of all uh, our high injury network. And coming this uh, spring and summer, we'll have the complete street design guidelines updates that MCDOT and planning have been working on for the last uh, year and a half to two years. So those are also kind of changing fundamentally the ways that we decide how we design and build these roadways and do improvements. Continuing to evaluate trail crossings and intersections. So the Parks Department has a new CIP project that was added uh, a couple of years ago. So they'll implement 15 more crossings for design and construction in 2020. Obviously, continuing to work with our state partners because obviously most of our serious and fatal injuries are along our state maintained roadways. All right. So, to give you kind of an idea of where these are, so these are some of the new signals and beacons that have been installed in the last couple of years. So, if it has a little star above it, that actually means it's been installed. Uh, if it's blank, that means it's something that we have planned to build. So, we have two new traffic signals that will be installed on Wisteria Drive and Crystal Rock Drive kind of along Middlebrook Road near Seneca Valley High School. Uh, Maryland 586 and Norris Drive will be installed by the State Highway Administration. Um, additional Hawk Beacons, so again, those are the signals that when the pedestrian activates it, uh, there's a flashing yellow, a solid yellow, and then a red to get them to stop. And then you can see the list there. Uh, the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, these are kind of, again, pedestrian activated in these devices, similar to the one over by Dawson's where It'll flash back and forth to kind of alert drivers that pedestrians entered the crosswalk. And so these are different locations all around the county from, you know, Germantown, Gaithersburg, Aspen Hill, um, North Bethesda, Bethesda CBD, and Silver Spring. So for corridor improvements, again, very similar. Uh, the kind of pink color is a bicycle facility. Um, so those are new bike lanes or protected bike lanes that will be installed. And in the blue is kind of the overall corridor improvement. So we have complete streets upgrades for Crabs Branch Way, Bell Pre Road, and Millibrook Road. Um, signal timing modifications we'll be doing along Shady Grove Road, which is one of the larger roads that the county maintains that is a uh, large arterial road. Um, you see a list of bicycle facilities. Obviously, the big part being some of the um, on-street Capital Crescent Trail in downtown Bethesda. Um, Aspen Hill will be our first neighborhood greenway pilot, so that's pretty exciting. It'll be connected to Glenmont Metro to the Aspen Hill corridor and actually kind of end right where we installed the Hawk Beacon last year. Um, bus stop improvements along Randolph Road, which is also a county maintained arterial. And I guess 15 additional upgrades to trail crossings. All these can be found on our website on the Vision Zero site. You just scroll down to the bottom of the project map and you can actually go and interact with all the projects and see what's been complete and what's scheduled uh, to come in your neighborhood. On the enforcement, again, we're going to continue our failed crash review team. Uh, and last year, we worked with the Maryland Highway Safety Office to review 2016 pedestrian fatalities. Uh, that was part of their statewide review. And we will actually start our own county team to review all the crashes starting in 2017 soon. And again, obviously, the biggest thing for enforcement is high visibility enforcement. So we have a calendar built out when we kind of do these high visibility enforcement. Uh, go ahead, can you go to the next slide? So again, our most dangerous behaviors is distracted driving, um, seatbelt use, impairment, aggressive driving, speeding, and overall pedestrian safety, pedestrian right-of-way protection. So we build out a calendar, and one thing that I want to hopefully do in my position is making sure that when we do the education and enforcement, we're kind of doing them in, in the very same areas. We still have data-driven enforcement, we have data-driven education, but sometimes, you know, education folks are over here, and 
working, and then you have the enforcement down here, so we'll make sure they're kind of working the same area to get that multiplier effect. So for education, um, we also want to make sure we update our comprehensive outreach strategy. We did an outreach strategy that was really focused on talking about dangerous behaviors. We actually didn't talk about how to talk about Vision Zero, because most people have no clue what that means. Um, so better branding, better explanations, how do we talk to people? I think even when we had things on the um, county calendar said, oh, Vision Zero, and people would not really show up. But if you said pet safety, they know, oh, I know what that is, I know what I'm talking about. So how we communicate what Vision Zero is and what it means to people's community is uh, really important. And making sure we're all on the same page when we say what Vision Zero is across the county government. Again, Safe Routes to School, we had a new Safe Routes to School coordinator join us last year. Um, and he's been doing a lot of work with the schools. We will be launching a new distracted driving campaign in April, uh, which is April's National Distracted Driving Month. That was something that really came to our attention as something we could potentially do more of um, for Vision Zero. So we want to make sure that with the um, enforcement and new education campaign that's specific to Montgomery County. And so this is actually an example. Um, this is just a draft, so we're still making changes to this, but this would potentially go on the, the back of a bus trying to get alert people about distracted driving. So again, traffic incident management is our kind of uh, police and fire specific, making sure that when we are going to the scene and on scene of a crash that our first responders are safe. Um, so we had a framework developed for their traffic incident management plan with the help of some consultants last year. So now we actually got to go and take the framework that was built and agreed upon and sync up our fire rescue and police traffic incident management plans, make sure they're vision zero focused and leading practice, practices are incorporated into both. And then our kind of our catch-all is the law policy and advocacy. Again, the big thing here is we'll be building our 10-year strategy. So I'll be um, rolling on in March or April timeframe kind of our plan for outreach for this 10-year strategy and basically figure out with the community and our partners how are we going to get to zero by 2030. Um, and also continuing support to our municipalities. The city of Tacoma Park and the city of Rockville are both uh, embarking on Vision Zero plans for their city, so we'll make sure that we can help them and make sure that we're all speaking the same language and uh, using the same data and all that. And again, as my coordinator, I have to make sure everyone's on the same page, so we have a monthly steering committee that's, that's met um, since we started the Vision Zero Action Plan. Uh, I'm going to add in a quarterly stakeholders meeting, which is kind of the larger partners, um, from kind of that second ring of community partners and county partners. We have annual progress reports and then annual strategic plans as we get through the work plans. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations to you. We're very pleased that you're in this position. Uh, Council Member uh, Rima. I could wait for the Do you want to wait? Is, is anybody here want to wait? Okay. Very good. Next speaker, please. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Jason Sartori. I'm the Chief of Functional Planning and Policy at the Planning Department. Uh, thank you for having us here today. And uh, I'm joined by, uh, as you mentioned before, Chair, Chair Anderson, as well as our Planning Director, Gwen Wright, and Planning uh, Deputy Director, Tanya Stern. Um, I want to uh, take a moment first to uh, thank Wade for highlighting the uh, important work uh, that they're doing with our Parks Department as well with our trail crossings. Uh, Parks isn't here today, but if you've got questions about that, we're, we'd be happy to um, address that as well. Um, so I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in the planning department, and uh, these are the things I'm going to highlight. We've got a, a Vision Zero work plan that we've created. It's an internal document that uh, we're tracking. We have it on our website. Uh, however, it is uh, really an internal document for us to guide our, our work in, uh, related to Vision Zero. We'll talk about a specific project, the predictive safety analysis, which we're pretty energized about at this point. Um, and uh, finally, give a quick overview of the work that we did in 2019 related to Vision Zero. Okay. So I think uh, Dr. Orlin here has the toughest job knowing when to advance the slides for us. Um, so uh, planning staff is often asked what, you know, what our role is with Vision Zero. We, we don't build anything and uh, we, we don't enforce traffic laws. Uh, so this slide here shows you, gives you an idea of the types of things that we do where we feel like we can uh, integrate Vision Zero into our work. Obviously the first thing, master planning. Also our development review and capital project review are mandatory referrals. Uh, and 
we think we do a pretty good job with data analysis, and so we have a, a you know a, that's something where where we can make an impact, and then finally with community engagement as well. So we have created a, as I mentioned, a, a detailed work plan. Uh, it's composed of actions that we can take undertake as part of our day to day, as well as larger items that have uh, made it into our official work program. And so uh, the actual document is split up into five different sections identified here. I'll give a, an overview of each of the sections, but this is included in your packet. It's uh, pages uh, circle four through 19. So you can see the, the detail behind it all. So with regard to uh, building knowledge and collaborative partnerships, uh, this uh, gets at something uh, to something also that, that Wade talked about in terms of uh, engaging the community and educating the community about how to talk about Vision Zero. Uh, this is, you know, this one example that you see on your screen here is the creation of a, a Vision Zero toolkit for community organizations. This is a way for those community organizations to, uh, to better understand Vision Zero and how, to provide, uh, and, and how to provide their community members with the resources they need to advocate for safety improvements in their neighborhoods. The next section of our, of our work plan uh, identify is, it relates to problem verification, and this is really uh, in where we get to our data and statistical analysis. So uh, ways that we can better understand the causes of severe injuries and fatalities on the county's transportation network. Uh, this section includes many actions, but perhaps the most exciting and most important is the predictive safety analysis that I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a couple minutes. The next section relates to developing solutions. So once the safety challenges have been systematically identified through our data collection and our analysis, uh, we will identify you know, engineering solutions and policy changes that address the safety challenges that are confronting the county. And um, the action on this particular slide talks to um, our work with DOT, MCDOT, with uh, the Complete Street Design Guide project. Uh, the next section relates to incorporating the solutions into our work program. So this is where we uh, talk about uh, integrating these solutions and these policy changes into our master plan recommendations, uh, into the work that we do re reviewing development applications or our review of capital projects. Uh, for example, on this slide, uh, we will develop procedures for systematically incorporating Vision Zero into the master planning and development review processes. And then finally, the last section of the document is just a summary of all the, um, the different actions that are included in the document with a, a summary of the, the resources that are involved uh, within the planning department and externally and our, our anticipated timeline for, for these. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the projects we uh, have in our work plan is the predictive safety analysis. Uh, and this was something that the planning board just last week said is one of our priorities for this fiscal year. So uh, one of the changes that many Vision Zero communities uh, undertake is a transition from a safety approach that focuses on locations where uh, high rates of severe injuries or fatalities have already occurred to one that is more proactive and identifies and treats locations with similar characteristics. So this approach uh, seeks to prevent serious, and, uh, serious injury and fatal crashes throughout the roadway network, including at locations without a recent history of crashes, uh, but where a high risk of future crashes may be suspected based on the roadway characteristics and the surrounding land use contexts. So uh, the approach will estimate crash rates uh, for each road segment and intersection in the county and use a statistical analysis to associate those crash rates with the local characteristics of the, those intersections and those roads. Uh, this will give us an, a way to, um, you know, a, an example that I think of is if you've got two intersections that are 95% the same, uh, but one has experienced crashes whereas the other hasn't, well, what is it about that 5% that is somehow making one unsafe and the other safer? Uh, how can we get at that and see, identify and target the solutions that we need, where we need them, and what types of solutions we need? Uh, so this project is also critical to uh, guiding not just the work that we do, uh, but also uh, as part of the, the county's 10-year action plan, uh, which the county intends to complete by the end of this year. 
And then finally, uh, just to take a minute, a quick minute to highlight some of the work that we've done over the past year, uh, we also hired our own uh, Vision Zero coordinator uh, to work on this work plan with us. Uh, and there's Jesse Cohn, who's also here today. Uh, Jesse joins us from uh, the uh, transportation consulting firm Fair and Piers DC, uh, where, among other things, she also led the, uh, the department's uh, equity initiative, her firm's equity initiative. So we're happy to have her on board, and she'll be working very closely with Wade and others at, at DOT, too, um, and our other partners. Uh, so other things that we've done, obviously, plans and studies, you're very familiar with most of these. The Viewers Mill Corridor Master Plan uh, was the plan that really rethought the department's role in Vision Zero. Uh, it was the centerpiece of that plan. Uh, it recommends short-term strategies to provide continuous uh, walkways and bikeways, improve access to transit, and increase connectivity to community facilities and neighborhood uses. Uh, in the long term, the plan recommends the transformation of Veers Mill from a motor vehicle dominated uh, corridor to a safe, efficient, and comfortable complete street. The Mark Rail commun uh, Community Sector Plan uh, recommended speed, uh, speed reductions and a road diet along a section of Middlebrook Road adjacent to Seneca Valley High School. The uh, Forest Glen and Montgomery Hills Sector Plan, which you will be taking up later this afternoon, um, it expands on the boulevard concept for Georgia Avenue uh, with recommendations to improve pedestrian and bicycle comfort there, uh, as well as safety, accessibility, and connectivity within the plan area. Uh, and it was also, I would highlight, the first of the county's plans to pilot, uh, pilot the uh, pedestrian level of comfort analysis that we've been doing as part of our ped uh, pedestrian master plan. Um, additionally, the, uh, well, I mentioned the, the pedestrian master plan. We are fully engaged on that at the moment, uh, and that, that ped, uh, pedestrian level of comfort, again, is, is doing an assessment of every single, uh, the, 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 the level of comfort for a pedestrian at every single segment of road in the county. Uh, very similar to our bi bicycle uh, stress map that we created with the bicycle master plan. Other activities, the Aspen Hill study identifies a broad range of solutions uh, from specific uh, intersection improvements to area-wide policies and strategies that comprehensively address uh, traffic safety in Aspen Hill. Uh, one of the other uh, main products of the pedestrian master plan is the, uh, the, the pedestrian level comfort map. Uh, and then as we previously, previously talked about, the complete streets design guide was something that was a major part of our 2019 effort too. Christy Daphnis is next. Thank you. And please, Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Council President Katz, for letting me speak today um, and to the rest of you for listening to me as well. Um, I wanted to start by congratulating Wade again um, for his appointment to the Vision Zero coordinator role. I know that that's something that the PBTSAC has been advocating for over the past couple of years to make sure that that position is staffed. It's a really crucial position to implementing Vision Zero in our county and um, Wade knows the data inside and out <clears throat> and has been a great partner to this point in engaging stakeholders um, and I'm sure he'll do an even more amazing job when he's able to focus on that as his full-time job. Um, I also wanted to mention both Jesse Cohn and um, Captain McBain, who are new to their roles uh, that are very relevant to <clears throat> implementation of Vision Zero. I think um, these three individuals will really be key to the success of Vision Zero in our county. Um, the three of them together are, are really the full-time county or MC, you know, parks and planning employees that need to make this happen. So um, I look forward to working with all three of them. Um, so I don't have a formal presentation prepared for today, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about what the PBTSAC has done over the last couple of years and what we're planning on focusing on over the next year. Um, as you all know, the PBTSAC is really the only advisory committee or body that advises both the county executive and the county council on these types of issues, pedestrian, bike, and traffic safety. Um, it's a really unique committee in that we are comprised of both member, um, you know, citizen members as well as representatives from the State Highway Administration, the county, and the planning department. Uh, so we have some very 
thoughtful and broad conversations about these issues in our meetings, and, and I think it's a, a really important place uh, where we all come together and think about the big picture and how we can get to zero, how we can prioritize these, these important issues in, in our um, in the big in the bigger context of the budget and other, and other things. Yay, President Obama. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think the other unique role that we are able to play given given how we're positioned is, is really the ability to engage um, other advocacy groups like WABA, Action Committee for Transit, MCCPTA, the Coalition for Smarter Growth, Civic Fed, Civic Associations, and, and others. So we really have um, put a focus on, on doing some more of that uh, so that we can have a full picture of, of what, what needs to be done and, and how we should be doing outreach to the community. Over. Over the past couple of years, I, I can say that I'm, I'm very proud of the work that the committee has done in helping to develop the two-year action plan. Um, I know that we played a really uh, vital role. Some of our, our members put a lot of time and effort into making sure that we had um, a very solid two-year plan um, that could get us some concrete actions uh, and make Vision Zero real. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. I think in the past year, we've really ramped up some of our convening uh, ability and out, outreach to the community. Um, we've started working with MCPS and DOT and state highways and the planning department to convene a quarterly um, student safety working group, which has been great. We've participated on the equity task force and on the Vision Zero steering committee. Um, we've done a lot of outreach to community organizations. We co-sponsored the Safe Routes to School Forum. Um, we have also held several of our community, or several of our regular committee meetings out in the community. And so far we've reached Wheaton, Germantown, Bethesda, Long Branch, um, and we'll be in Rockville next at our next community-focused meeting. Um, that will be an interesting meeting because I know that's a, a municipality and they have their own um, pedestrian and bike safety committees as well. So the more that we can collaborate and help um, help come to this with one voice, I think uh, we, we, want, we would like to do that. Um, we also have been very engaged in some of the planning departments, um, master plan and study activities, um, including the Aspen Hill Vision Zero study, the Veris Mill master plan, um, and and now the um, now the pedestrian master planning process. Um, as far as our priorities for the the coming year, I sort of see this in in three buckets. Um, first, I think we would like to continue to advise uh, um, the council and the county executive on various budget issues. Um, and advocate for more funding, as I've mentioned in the past. I know that there is a plus up of $24 million um, in the county executive's budget proposal. Um, is that enough? Is there ever enough? I don't know, <laughs> probably not. Uh, but, but really we need to think about where do we have needs in terms of basic infrastructure. I know some of you may have seen my tweet yesterday with the gentleman um, riding his scooter, motorized scooter down the middle of the lane because that piece of sidewalk, which is a county-owned sidewalk, is not ADA accessible. Um, we have these problems on state and on county roads, so we need to fix it. We need to have access for everyone um, in snow or when there's not snow. <laughs> so um, that, I think, is a very important thing that we want to focus on, um, not just the basic infrastructure, but how can we quickly implement innovative and low-cost solutions in different areas, and how can we automate some of the work that could be done through automation, like the automated speed enforcement, red light cameras, and things like that. So you'll hear more from us on that during your budget hearings and, and outside of this, this process. Um, second, I think we want to help contribute to and enable this 10-year plan. We want it to be aggressive and achievable. Um, and I think that's that's not in conflict. Um, we've made a lot of progress as a county on changing the culture around pedestrian, bike, and traffic safety and really getting into this Vision Zero mentality. 
Um, and we just need to continue down that path and we're here ready to help advise um, in that process. And then third, um, we would like to help aid in the implementation of the state highways context driven design guidelines um, and keep keep our eye on the ball in that regard um, so that as we figure out what those mean in our county we're there to help um, advise the executive as well as the council um, last I, I would just say that the only way that we'll get to zero is through a deliberate um, collaborative and systemic change um, in the way that we're prioritizing and, and in the way we're looking at some of the funds and actions and activities that we're engaged in as a community. Um, so with that, uh, we're here to, to help you all and to um, provide that forum for further discussions and, and um, more, more conversation and action. Thank you very much yeah. and thank you to all the speakers. Uh, Council Member Reamer, please. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, I'm glad we're having this discussion today. I thank my colleagues for, uh, and the council president for putting it on the agenda. Um, I wanted to just start by uh, teeing off something that Wade, that you said, which I really agree with. Um, I think every time we say the words Vision Zero, we are missing an opportunity to say something that people will actually understand and connect with. And we have got to, we're spending so much time communicating people this concept of Vision Zero. People understand what it means to prioritize safety. What they don't necessarily agree with yet is that we should really prioritize safety. And that when you do that, you get results. And I think we could do a much better job just really being very direct with people that uh, we can make a lot more progress by prioritizing safety in our decisions about engineering and road design as well as enforcement. We, we have at our disposal enforcement mechanisms that I think our police department is a little bit too uh, reticent to use as much as we could uh, with camera enforcement. I think we could do a lot more camera enforcement and we could significantly reduce the speed that people drive and the amount of, of significant fatal or, or uh, serious injury crashes that we have, whether that's drivers or pedestrians or bikers, all of them you know, victimized by, by speed and by our permissiveness about the speeds that you can use uh, when you're behind the wheel. So you know, I, I would just like to see us generally working on safety. Um, and I don't mean to diminish the work of the police department at all. I'm just saying I, I believe that we could do a lot more you know, we, we often focus on engineering and construction, and that's, in, that's essential. Uh, but we have enforcement tools. We don't really use that assertively. Um, I, I wanted to uh, say I'm, I'm pleased with the uh, recommendation this year f to fund the, the BIPA program, the Bike, Pedestrian, Priority Areas Improvement Program. Casey Anderson is here. He began work on this uh, years ago with the planning process, and uh, we added it as a capital budget item. And uh, it, it, the vision of it is just what you articulated there, Christy. It's let's look at these areas that have deteriorated infrastructure, deteriorated sidewalks. Let's rebuild them and make them, um, you know, demonstration projects for safe, walkable, bikeable infrastructure where drivers are, everyone is aware of one another. And, and uh, so we've got to move ahead on forwarding that, uh, funding that, and uh, I really am glad the council kept that money in there this year had been recommended to be removed because uh, it certainly makes it a lot easier to build on it. There's one key piece of that though, which is the Fenton Street Bikeway in the Silver Spring BIPA, uh, which I'm concerned about delay. I don't want to see any delay on delivering the Silver Spring uh, infrastructure. And then there's the tunnel, uh, the Capitol Crescent Trail Tunnel, which is not a BIPA, but I think it's very closely related. And I, we have got to fund that tunnel. Uh, we've got to get that back on track. Um, wanted to ask uh, about, Christy, what you asked about, which is you want to work with the county and the state on the context-sensitive design. Where, where are we, uh, Tim, I'll, I guess I'll direct, are we yet talking, are you talking yet with our MCDOT? Has that initiated? Last time we were here, Greg, you know, laid this out. I think it's fantastic. I'm really so excited to see this happen. But when is it operationalized? When are we at the table with you to figure out where to apply that, what those contexts are? What are the boundaries of the urban areas? What are the boundaries of the, you know, so on and so forth? How do those maps apply? So where we're at right now is uh, 
we're still in the, the feedback gathering stage with the, the guide because we didn't want to go official with it until we got everyone's feedback. Um, we will be pushing out uh, a GIS map that will allow folks to kind of dive down into the context uh, zones a little more. I know uh, I've, I've reached out and spoken a couple different opportunities with Michael Paler with Montgomery County um, DOT. So we, we had informal discussions, but what we wanted to do was get to the point where we have the, the map out and then uh, we are also mainly doing internal discussions and education with our own state highway staff. And then the next step was to reach out with our local partners and stakeholders. So when can we expect that to happen? We were, uh, that, it's funny you asked, we were having that discussion just yesterday. We, we were hoping to have that between now and, and the end of our fiscal year, so in July, start having those discussions with our, our local partners. I, mean, I, I would really ask uh, that you send us a date. Could, okay. could you please take it back to your team, talk, talk, you know, talk about it, and let us know what to expect, because I'm, I'm getting anxious here. You know, it was, it was, I don't know when it was, November, and uh, I, I just think we need to get that going as fast as possible. We'd like to partner with you. We'd like to, you know, be your early implementer for that. Um, and, you know, th things tend to move along when you have concrete dates. So could we ask you to, you know, Absolutely. come back to us there? Um, uh, on the speed limits, we passed legislation last year, maybe the year before, allowing the county to reduce speed limits on neighborhood roads uh, under 25. Um, Wade, is there any uh, forward movement on, on uh, neighborhood roads coming down to 20 miles per hour as requested by the neighborhoods? Um, I'm not sure. I would have to turn my head around quick and see what I can't take on. Like any good executive, I pass off the hard questions. <laughs> we, we have not done anything new with that at the moment, just to keep in mind that the um, serious injury and fatal crashes tend not to be on those roads. That's something we are starting to look at. Um, Michael behind me is setting up some criteria in which uh, lower than 25 might be applicable, and we've had the authority to do that within the urban areas already, and the, right. the change in legislation allows us to do that bro more broadly. Thank you. De definitely understood it's not where the fatal crashes usually happen, but it's about the safety. It's about the culture of safety and, and, and you know, trying to get everyone to start thinking differently about how they drive and how they, how they walk, how they bike, all of that together. Uh, Completely agree with you, and it's one of the non-enumerated items in the plan, too, is for us to look at all the county roads to make sure the speed limits are appropriate for the conditions we're trying to achieve. Okay. Now, last thing before I pass it on. So the um, road code, I'm really happy we're moving forward on the road code redesign. I tried to get that funded several years in a row, uh, had it, lost it, had it, lost it, a lot of savings plans. But now it's, it's when is it coming to the council? Uh, that might be a Chris question again, Chris Conklin, I don't know. Or is it Jason? Yeah, Chris, why don't you stay up here yeah. with us, please? Yeah. Let's have MCDIT. And, and if I can in, invite Assistant Chief Didone to please join us at the yeah. I believe it's April or well. May. We are working through our final internal draft at the moment um, uh -huh. and look to resolve those comments and, and then release it shortly. So this is a comprehensive rewrite of, of the rules for how we design and build roads, you know, every, everywhere outside of the urban areas, I think, basically. It's, is it's for all areas. Of it's the for county. all areas. And we are dispensing with the templates that we used to have that specify very specific outcomes for different roads, and going with a totally different framework and definition of the types of roads and the functions they're supposed to achieve in the environments there. And it's pretty closely aligned with what the state is doing, but perhaps a little bit more detailed. Terrific. Well, I'm, Delighted that you'll be there at MCDOT to guide that process, and I'm, I'm really eager to take that up here at the council, so I hope we'll get that as soon as possible. It's been a good collaboration of the stakeholders to get to where we are. Thanks. Thank you very much. Council Member Glaeus. Thank you, Mr. President, for organizing this meeting and for organizing the upcoming town hall that will be held on February 9th in Wheaton. But we're here today because in the year 2019, we had 13 deaths and 593 incidents on our roads. And I want to thank you all for joining us for these series of conversations that we've been having over the last year. And in the years prior to that, with the development of the Vision Zero strategy, um, Mr. Sotori, thank you for the ongoing efforts that you're doing at planning. Uh, Mr. Smith, thank you for taking the helm uh, at least in an acting capacity at SHA, uh, a critical partner to all of the work that we are doing. Uh, and 
your predecessor um, was doing great work in helping us get to where we need to be. So um, if you or whomever else uh, officially becomes the administrator at SHA, look forward to working hopefully with you uh, in that capacity. Ms. Daphnis, uh, the volunteer sitting on, on the panel, uh, thank you for the Herculean efforts that you undertake day in, day out, nights, weekends. Um, it's noted and it's appreciated. And Mr. Holland, welcome. This is a long time coming. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting down with you yesterday before the news was made public so that we could have a conversation uh, about your role, about the importance of your role, um, and, and your appointment in general. Um, and, and with your appointment right now, uh, progress has been made on the 41 point Vision Zero plan because one of the 41 points right. was hiring a Vision Zero coordinator. Wow. So we now have 31 mm. of the 41 points either in progress, scheduled, or, or ongoing. So progress has been made this week, and that is a good thing. Um, in our conversation, which I'll, I'll, I'll share now um, publicly, yeah, I charged three, three things of you, um, understanding that you are in the executive department, but this is a critically important function and a an critically important mission. Uh, one is to enact the Vision Zero strategy um, as swiftly and ably as you can, and clearly with your appointment, again, uh, progress has been made. Uh, another aspect is in order to do that role, in order for you to do your job properly, you need to be out in the community, and you need to be meeting with community groups, civic associations, faith-based groups, business groups, anyone who wants to talk about making our roads and streets safer, you need to be there. And you need to walk in their shoes, literally and figuratively, to see the state of our infrastructure and how we can improve that. Um, and from going down on, you know, having a responsibility to, to walk the walk and be on terra firma, um, alternatively, you need to be 30,000 feet in the air looking at our bureaucracy, looking at how we make our police department, our school system, our transportation department, all of the different agencies and departments that are integral to making this a success, you need to figure out how they're all working together. And if they're not, you come back here and you talk to us because we have your back and we're committed to doing whatever we can to make you successful. You have to be successful. We want you to be successful and the 1.1 million residents of Montgomery County are counting on you because this is a matter of life and death. And so this is the first time that you're before us in this role. Please do come back often and call on us when you need help to be successful. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Navarro. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council President, for uh, scheduling this very important briefing uh, so quickly after so many of us um, have um, commented, obviously, on what it is that we need to continue to do to uh, have the spotlight on this very important issue. So I also want to thank everybody who is here, because each and every one of you plays a very important role in what um, seems like a frustrating, constant um, challenge for us. And uh, it is very hard as we go around the county having these conversations. Uh, and I know for me personally, I've had to reflect a lot on what exactly continues to happen because we do look at the statistics and although um, we've had numbers that show how you know neighboring jurisdictions may have higher statistics than, than we do the reality is that you know this this continues to be a persistent challenge that we cannot um, be complacent about and I don't know sometimes I wonder if you know what has happened if you do take that sort of high level approach and, and take a look at what's occurring the reality is that Montgomery County was designed as a bedroom community uh, that has, you know, grown considerably. And uh, we've worked, I think, very diligently to pass master plans and to pass land use policies that recognize that we have some urban centers and we've worked so hard on those. But the other reality is that, you know, human behavior and how you choose to make Montgomery County home 
uh, doesn't necessarily fit ne very neatly in a lot of those master plans. And so there are, in my opinion, very many swaths and corridors and neighborhoods in our county that uh, continue to be designed, well, they were designed as bedroom communities, but they're not anymore. They're not that place where you just had one car and you had the family and you went to work in DC and you came back. We have very dense areas where we have residents who bike because that is their mode of transportation or use public transportation, not by choice necessarily because they want to be environmentally friendly, but because this is their only way. And, uh, and so I believe that in many instances, we do need to take a step back and look at all those particular plans that we have, whether it's the planning department, you know, whether it's the vision zero now with uh, Mr. Holland at the helm, uh, and maybe look at it from that perspective because we're missing something. And my frustration is that no matter how many CIPs we look at, the reality is that we're trying to, you know, <laughs> address all of this at once, knowing that we're never going to have enough funding to do it all uh, together. So I say that as just something that I know we are trying to, to figure out time and time again. So I do have a, just a couple of specific questions. I guess one of them, Mr. Holland, I mean, uh, just last night there was a well-known Latino activist that was asking me about, you know, this whole Vision Zero and what is, uh, what is the county uh, response or capacity when it comes to addressing issues in the Latino community be that there's proportionally there seems to be uh, incidents that are happening in these communities and whether, uh, for example, you have uh, in your, uh, you know, complement of staff uh, or resources, people who are uh, bilingual or are Latino or that are tasked with being able to go into these communities uh, and uh, explain what it is that we're doing and gather the feedback. So that's my first question. Right, yeah, I mean, we're gonna, with having been the full-time coordinator, right, that's, as uh, Councilmember Glass mentioned, that is my job to go out to all of our communities. So one thing we wanna try and do early on in the winter is engaging our uh, minority health initiatives as partners, they're already in the communities. Um, they have connections, they can help us reach more folks. Um, we do have some bilingual staff, uh, I speak Spanish, but the last time I tried to use it, the guy laughed and said, I know enough English, so. Ahora lo puedes practicar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, so you know, we have staff, we have contractors who are also bilingual if, if need be, so making sure that we outreach to those folks and use our you know, regional service center directors, you know, minority health initiative, um, a lot of the other community partners, faith-based organizations, nonprofits to reach out to those folks. Because like yeah. I said, you yeah. know, when we tried to recruit for the Vision Zero Equity Task Force, again, same issue, Vision Zero, what's that? Equity, what's that? Um, if we said, let's make sure we put the money where the problem is, you know, maybe more people show up. Because we had it in English and Spanish when we did the outreach, but um, it just wasn't enough. I appreciate that. So, I, so it seems like you've thought about it. I think that we already have a lot of capacity in the administration. So we've got the Department of Community Partnerships, you just mentioned the Latino Health Initiatives. We've had promoters in the past, promotores, which is a really good way of doing this. And we have a lot of PIOs, a lot of communication specialists in each of the departments, plus the executive has a good complement. So I think that really leveraging that capacity is gonna go a long way. Um, so having a very specific plan for how that's gonna occur would be really important. It would go, you know, mm -hmm. I, th I think a long way. So I appreciate really your thinking about that. Um, so just a couple of things. I know that um, we in the past have had some conversations about, and I know I brought up this issue of additional lighting in some of those areas. And, you know, I know that we don't want to just be reactive, but sometimes we have to do that. Um, and so I'm wondering where we are with, uh, you know, some kind of approach to um, install additional lighting uh, in, in, in those particular areas. We, we keep hearing about how a lot of these issues have been occurring after sunset. Um, so where are we with lighting and some of the time signal adjustments? This is something that came up in the last briefing. Well, with lighting, um, we obviously have our streetlight CIP, which is um, being implemented with a conversion, which is improving light levels and dealing with a lot of fixtures that may be out. Um, in addition to that, there are infill projects within that that are addressing areas that have been identified as needing additional street lights. We have a program where we respond to requests for sort of onesie, twosie individual street lights and those get installed. Um, with the pedestrian safety CIP increase that's been proposed, 
that's another funding source that can be used to address lighting at specific locations where we have a documented um, safety issue. For example, um, Bell Pre Road is a place where um, that sort of enhanced lighting has been proposed. <laughs> so there's the ability to use some of these safety-related CIP projects to improve lighting as we go forward. Then you are asked, you going to identify those particular places, or is that something also that we can just, through our own CIP, I guess, deliberations, we can put forth those corridors or? So in the streetlight CIP, there's a long backlog of projects right. that will already consume that, of right. course, but in the, there is not such a backlog for the safety related ones. Some of them have been identified through the road safety audit program and are identified as recommendations, but if there are other locations that are of concern, we're happy to hear about those and prioritize those into the, that work program. I appreciate that. I really do. And I, you know, I, I just want to also mention that in the past I've worked with your department, uh, New Hampshire Avenue in Colesville used to be just pitch dark with a lot of bus stops, uh, and uh, you were very responsive. So I know that we can do it. I just want to make sure that we, you know, that we're all aware that those resources can yes. be there. We can utilize those. You asked about street lights too. The yeah. timing. Yeah, we've completed yeah. the initial retiming, and we're again we're moving into a process where there is money in that CIP to address issues where the timing is insufficient for the population we have there, either because of age or mobility limitation or other considerations, exactly. young students that say mm -hmm. the seven second walk isn't long enough mm -hmm. or the crossing, the uh, flashing don't walk time is too short for that particular location based on those circumstances. So we'll continue to implement those as those recommendations come forward through the studies that we're doing. Thank you. Um, also, uh, for you know, Department of Transportation, um, we uh, also discussed uh, in the last briefing um, the issue of analyzing the ability to analyze crash data. You did um, there was you know co uh, conversations that we had. You stated that um, DOT was in the process of working on a better information sharing platform with the Montgomery County Police Department. Um, is that on its way? And do, do, does it require some additional funding as we consider our budgets? It doesn't. I think with um, Captain Mc McBain's arrival and, and um, Deputy Chief, um, I forgot his name, Didon, because I'm used to calling him Captain. <laughs> yes. um, as long as he doesn't forget his name, <laughs> then we're good. Yeah. Um, we, we've established a new protocol where they're sharing the crash, not all of the details, but the relevant details with us as soon as these incidents occur. And our primary interest in that is to understand whether there's, there's an immediate safety defect that we need to correct. Um, so that's that's in place at this point. And that information sharing with the traffic division is going well, and I'm getting those reports too. And it's very helpful for us to be able to look and see at those locations what circumstances did we have there? Can we draw similarities to others? And most importantly, is there something that needs an immediate correction, or is this part of our ongoing process to address the high incidence locations? So. It's been more of a person-to-person um, -person communication issue that's been resolved, and that information sharing has been very helpful. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Smith, um, just wanted to inquire also, um, we did have a very uh, tragic pedestrian crash last fall on Randolph Road and Georgia Avenue interchange. Um, and uh, during the last briefing as well with the previous administrator, Mr. Slater, um, we were told that there would be a study uh, done particularly around this area and it would be completed in January and we are here ending up ending January. I was wondering if the study had been, if you know anything about whether that study was completed and when I could perhaps get a briefing on that. I'm going to lean on uh, my district team there a little bit. Do you, do we? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, regarding the Maryland 97 at ICC ramp, um, fatality that happened right. in the fall. Yeah, this one is Randolph Road oh, and Randolph Georgia. Road. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That study is being finalized right now, and we're working with our local partners and our Office of Traffic and Safety in terms of potential options that we can move forward with to uh, improve situations there. Is there a timeline, you think, that in terms of when I can get a briefing on that? Sure, I would say in the next, uh, are we comfortable with the next 30 to 40, 30 days? 
Yeah. All right, if you Right now. Yeah. Yes. So we'll reach out to your office to set something up. Thank you so much. And once again, I just really want to thank every everyone uh, who's here today, uh, and know that we are doing everything we can to understand not only, you know, what are those things that we can do that would get things rolling better, but also, you know, understanding through your collaboration what are those other things that we may be missing. So it's it's really important, and I really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you very much. I was, I'm going to jump in for two seconds. You know, the, the council has thanked me for scheduling this, and quite candidly, I'm sorry that we had to schedule this. This was not something that we wanted to do. This is something that we necessarily have to do. And of course, we realized this was a problem before the tragedies that happened. We're, we're joined today by at least one member of, of, the, of a family who lost a loved one, and, and our heart goes out to them. Um, we don't, you know, when, I've always said that I don't like the name Vision Zero because I think it sounds like when you're talking about pedestrians that people should have much more vision than zero when they're walking across the street. But I, Assistant Chief Didone was at a, an event last night and, and I congratulate him on his uh, becoming uh, an acting Assistant Chief and, and uh, Captain McBain uh, for, for the jobs that they're doing. But uh, he said yesterday, you know, that then he pointed out, he says, you know, one is too many. And if you don't have a vision for zero, and I'm quoting him, and I'm closely quoting him, I guess, sort of quoting him, that uh, what would be the right number? And of course, the right number is zero. So it sort of changed my opinion on the name of it. But I still believe that, that we can never be too safe, and we need to work with each of you and our partners. And, and, uh, and, and have mentioned that the municipalities, Rockville and Gaithersburg and Tacoma Park and all the other municipalities that have their own roads, we need to coordinate through them. And I know Wade oh, has, he's been here for at least one day now, so I know that, that he, was, he was acting before. But, but uh, I know that he will do that, and I feel confident that he will do that, and I congratulate him on his job. I think it is necessary to remember that it's the three E's. It's engineering, enforcement, and education. We need to keep doing that. We need to keep reminding each other of the importance of it. Uh, it's been mentioned, but I want to mention again that we are having another town hall meeting. We're having a town hall meeting at Wheaton High School on Sunday, February 9th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's, we normally don't have town hall meetings on Sunday, but we wanted to go into the community where people have had these horrible tragedies happen uh, as close to the community as we can be so that we can meet with them directly. I think it's something that we should consider as a community that uh, I, I think maybe we should coordinate with the business community that we have very visible d vests that we hand them out when ride on buses and in grocery stores and liquor stores and every other type of, of business that, that and maybe they can even put advertising on it. I don't know. It, it's, it's something that I've thought of. But in many cases, and I'm as guilty as anyone, I wear a dark coat. Uh, at night when, uh, I mean, I know that I'm not as visible as I should be. Um, our, our lighting, and though we can work on our lighting and we will work on our lighting, we're not going to do it as quickly in every spot and every time as we need. So people have to be educated, have to remember that when they are out, that they, that in some cases, drivers cannot see them. And so we want them to understand it. We're, we're in many ways distracted in a lot of things we do. And, and that's for both the driver and the, and the pedestrian. There's, we walk with earphones in our ear or earbuds in our ear, and, and therefore we're not as, we're not as uh, cognizant of the area around us. We just have to do a better job, but we need to make certain our neighbor is doing a better job as well. Um, I, I, uh, think that, that when we continue to work together, and I can tell you this council and, and the county executive with his, with his uh, announcement yesterday of Wade, we are committed to doing that, and we need to make certain that it's coordinated and it's effective. So I'm going to ask uh, next, uh, please, Council Member, Vice President Hucker to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, and Tim and Wade, congrats on your new positions. We look forward to working closely with you. And Christy, thanks for your indefatigable volunteer work. We have a long way to go. Um, you can hear from all of my colleagues how deeply committed we are to this program. Um, we're also deeply saddened to be here, as the Council President said, and, and uh, to be called to this hearing because of the recent pedestrian fatalities. And Ms. Baden, we're very, very sorry for your loss and all the other affected families. Um, 
I think we're also very deeply um, disturbed by the number of serious accidents and uh, crashes and, and uh, injuries and, and fatalities that we've had for quite some time in Montgomery County. And as if Elijah Cummings were here, he would say we have to do better. We're going to, I think, in this forum and also in the T&E committee that I chair, going to keep pushing for changes and in investments and actions from, from all of you. Um, and since many of my colleagues have mentioned the cost of retrofitting and re-engineering a county that was mostly designed for drivers, uh, we, it's true we need a lot more re-engineering and we're grateful to the county executives' investments in the CIP and we need a lot more lighting. Um, we also need a great deal more enforcement. I agree with Council Member Reamer, and largely that pays for itself. And I will remind my colleagues, because I don't think it came up, uh, will come up again, that we have a state bill we have to take a position on, ideally next Monday, that offers a solution of automated enforcement of our distracted driving laws that we should adopt and ask the state for permission to uh, consider that program here. Montgomery County was an early adopter of red light cameras and speed cameras and school bus cameras. And I was on the committee in Annapolis when we adopted many of those. And there are people walking down the street and driving down the street alive today because of those cameras. And we should, I think it's irresponsible to do anything but uh, take advantage of our best available technology to keep our people safe. And that includes automated enforcement of distracted driving. So I look forward to talking to you about that again on, um, on Monday. Um, Tim, I'll start with you since, uh, since we're glad you're here. Um, State Highway recently narrowed the travel lanes to, on Maryland 97 in Wheaton to 10-foot inner lanes with 12-foot curb lanes. Connecticut Avenue similarly narrow. Why doesn't State Highway narrow all the lanes on multi lane arterials from 10 feet to the median to provide a buffer zone at the curb for pedestrians on sidewalks directly adjacent to the travel lines. Um, as you might know, we recently lost one of our young people, Jason, Jacob Castle, because he fell into a travel lane because he was on a sidewalk that was unnecessarily adjacent to a travel lane. Many SHA maintained arterials in our county are six lane roads with 34 foot carriageways on either side of a 16 foot, 16 but raised median, 16 inch raised median, with narrow sidewalks along the curbs, narrowing the travel lanes to 10 foot would provide a four foot buffer along the sidewalks that could save lives and might have saved Jacob. What do you think? I think that's an opportunity we need to look at every time we resurface. Uh, we only touch maybe four to five percent of our network each year with resurfacing. And I know with Andre and his team, he's brought to me several ideas of narrowing lanes in order to provide that additional buffer or to make things, uh, it's the best way to describe it. Uh, when you're narrow lanes, people sometimes drive a little slower. Um, yeah. And we're looking at, every time we're resurfacing, we're looking at opportunities where we can make those type of improvements. But it's a, also a balancing act because we're, we don't want to create, create a new risk. Um, so that's why we look at each project individually. And when I say new risk, um, I don't want to say tell everyone to narrow every, all lanes throughout the state. I guess that's that's sure. what I'm trying to, to couch that with. So I, I, we got to be strategic about where we where we where we make those decisions. Sure. But we're talking about our congested urban areas. Absolutely. And I'm always struck, as I was just two days ago, at how slowly people drive on Connecticut Avenue, where you have narrow lanes and speed cameras, and then on Route 29 on my side of the county. We spent all last year talking about racial equity here. You have a real racial equity issue where you have speed cameras in narrow lanes on the west side of the county and wide lanes and no speed cameras on, for most of it on the east side of the county. And I think we could do better, and I look forward to our DOT having that conversation with you. Okay. Um, for DOT and uh, State Highway, let me ask um, a question I brought up back in November. You don't, either one, I, I don't believe, allow many speed sentries or speed radar feedback signs to be installed um, long term. It seems, my experience is it's a struggle to get them. Um, they are often, it, once, once they're put in place, they're put in place, it's called a test. I'm not sure why they need to be tested. They work. The data from the city of Rockville indicates that even when they're in one place for a long term, it changes driver behavior. 
I imagine many of my colleagues who have gotten tickets from the one on Maryland Avenue, and we can tell you firsthand it will change your behavior. Uh, why can't we get more speed sentries on state highways where we have an enforcement problem? I know that I'm willing to work with the county to figure out what those challenges are. I'm not equipped to be able to answer that question right now for you. I know, like I mentioned before, that we're looking at innovative ways using technology to improve safety. If uh, what I'm concerned about is there's policies or, or regulations that prohibit us. Mm -hmm. if, those are, if, if those are the case, I would love to, to work with our legislative bodies to, to try to address that. If it is simply a, a resource or preferred practice, that's something that we can address in State Highway itself. Okay, thanks. Uh, as you know, Hawk signals were legalized by the state a couple years ago. The implementation and adoption in, here in the county on state highways has been, in my experience, painfully slow, even at crossings where the beacons are warranted by the MUTCD guidelines. Um, a notable example in my district is right on Georgia Avenue at Fenwick Lane, um, where we finally got the Hawk signal, but it will be a flashing beacon rather than a hybrid beacon with red, uh, uh, with a red phase even though it's warranted there. Um, why don't you install hybrid beacons wherever they're warranted um, on state highways? So, I, I, not a traffic engineer, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night, so I'm gonna do my best to answer your question. Um, where I understand Hawks to be the most advantageous is on mid-block crossings. Where we have challenges is where we're putting hawks at, at, at T intersections or cross intersections. Uh, it, it, poten it creates potential challenges for folks that want to turn right on red on those locations. So we've tried to focus our improvements for hawks at mid-block crossings because we feel like those give us the most advantage without introducing unnecessary risk. I think many of us would rather see fewer people turning right on red if we had safer pedestrians and we would take the hawk signals with the red phase. We prefer those, especially in our crowded urban areas. Understood. Um, neither SHA or uh, DOT actively maintain the sidewalks on state roads. DOT performs the maintenance on sidewalks on state roads by request. Um, they're often the most dangerous in the county on state roads uh, because of the proximity to high-speed traffic. Why can't we have a proactive maintenance program for high-risk sidewalks on state highways? As far as um, improving where we have if you, you could name any state highway in my district and I'll I could tell you what's wrong with the sidewalk how many times we've probably called state highway or DOT and then how slow the progress is to whether we're talking about Piney Branch Road University New Hampshire Avenue Georgia in many cases Chris uh, we, we have completed our sidewalk inventory that we're finalizing that so that we can release it it identifies a lot of the maintenance needs and we are figuring out how to proactively address those. It won't address the inherently um, dangerous situation of the sidewalk immediately adjacent to the road. Those are larger scale improvements, but the maintenance related improvements are gonna start to be prioritized and implemented by MCDOT. We'll need a lot of that attention in Long Branch and we have a long wish list we've, we've recently sent in that'll include lighting there as well. Could I ask Michael to join us just for a question or two? Um, Michael and I had the pleasure of walking with some of our state delegates and neighborhood activists recently along University Boulevard um, and Long Branch, but University Boulevard in particular where we had a pedestrian fatality. Can you update us on your efforts to improve pedestrian safety there on University East of Piney Branch and what help you might need from Tim? I'm um, not sure that we need help, and, and certainly uh, uh, Vice President uh, of the Council, thank you, Tom, for inviting me up, but not sure I need help. I've been working with the District 3 office on those initiatives. Some of the things that we've done is looked at bus stop re relocations, which was a, a significant issue in that corridor, and I'm not sure that that was able to be materialized. <laughs> Um, and with the purple line influx, so the bus stop relocations was a, was a particular problem because uh, the residents of that area and that corridor were crossing at mid-block and crossing at areas where there weren't traffic signals, where there was no signalization, so the, the crossings were unsafe. And what we determined during our walk is that if we could relocate the bus stops closer to the corners, we could eliminate that movement. And there were some issues because of the 
the introduction or the, the presence of the purple line <coughs> and how relocating those bus stops might not be feasible. So the, the presence of the purple line is creating some unique problems for both of our agencies in trying to um, address some of the safety needs through there. I thought you had ideas for, I uh, appreciate the need to move the bus stops, but that's Absolutely. certainly somewhat inconveniencing the riders. I'm more interested in slowing down the drivers, and I'd like to see some enforcement actions there, but I thought you had ideas for some raised table to make it safer for people to cross there, given the, the density of the multifamily housing across the street from the park. So on, uh, and you're talking about University Park, University Boulevard, so on University Boulevard, the, the, the type of traffic that we see on University is probably not conducive for having raised tables. So if, if we talked about raised tables there, I apologize, Tom. I don't know that that necessarily came up. I know we talked about the bus stop relocation. We talked about possibly having a signal at um, one, of the, um, one of the roadways closer to Piney Branch. Um, but again, there, the influx of the Purple Line and the, and the phasing of that construction and the need to probably we'd put a, a signal would be erected and then it would be taken down and maybe put back up because of the modifications associated with the roadway during those construction times, you know, made it really difficult for for the, the state highway administration, Purple Line team, and our team to come to a consensus on what the appropriate improvement would be there. So. Well, I appreciate the challenge, but the yeah, construction yeah. will be going on for another couple of years, so I think Certainly. you need to put more time into figuring out how to keep people safe in the meantime. Um, Wade, question. Chris, yeah. Uh, our, our Purple Line coordinator has an active list of improvements they're tracking with Purple Line and State Highway for that quarter. I don't know if they're expressly what you mentioned, but that is something we're actively tracking to make sure that we can get uh, the, the improvements in place while the construction is ongoing. Thanks. And then, Wade, just a quick question for you. Your data showed that um, serious crashes in, with motorists were down 50% um, or serious injuries involving motorists, whereas pedestrians and, and cyclists were somewhat up or flat. Do you have any conclusion from that? Is that good or news that shows any? Well, the motorists yeah. in particular? Um, passengers and motorized vehicles. Yeah, I mean, part of it is um, safer vehicle design. You have more devices that help people, automated braking, detection, lane change, all of those things help. Um, I haven't dug deep enough to look and see what the impairment numbers look like to see if we are seeing more or fewer impairments uh, because that can be anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of our uh, motor vehicle deaths a year. So I have to go a little bit deeper and see what that looks like. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Council Member Freitz, and I just want to remind my colleagues that we do have several other things on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the fact that we're all here for this conversation. I deeply regret the circumstances for why we're here for this conversation. I, I do appreciate some of the progress that we've made. I think we all recognize we haven't made near enough progress and that there are devastating consequences to that lack of progress. Uh, first, Mr. Smith, thank you for being here. Uh, we welcome uh, you here. I personally had a and continue to have a very good working relationship with your uh, predecessor, uh, and we look forward to continuing with that relationship in his new role, uh, but hopefully uh, we can continue with the uh, really strong partnership and working relationship that, uh, that we have all had, I think, as a body, and that I have had uh, personally look forward to that, and I really appreciated your comments earlier about the context-driven guidelines, which you know, we see as potentially game-changing for what we have been trying to do for years, if not longer. Uh, to fundamentally change design, engineering, and maintenance of our roadways. That is at the heart of Vision Zero. And so I really appreciate you uh, mentioning that. I'm excited as well, Mr. Sartori, you being here and, and really excited about the predictive safety analysis. Vision Zero needs to have data to function properly so we make these decisions in the proactive, not reactive way that we uh, talked about uh, earlier. We should be using data, not anecdotes, responding to tragedies. Uh, to make our uh, decisions. So I really appreciate your work on this, the conversations that you and I have had on that effort, uh, and the leadership of uh, Casey Anderson, who's here, Gwen Wright, uh, who's here, Mike Riley, many of the other folks, the entire planning board and uh, planning department uh, really has uh, been a leader on this and uh, looking forward to that as well. And welcome, Jesse Cohen. We look forward to having you uh, in this new role and really looking forward to having both of our Vision Zero uh, coordinators, which I think are, are critical to us moving forward. 
I echo the comments of uh, colleagues, Mr. Holland, in congratulating you and very well-deserved uh, appointment, uh, not only because you've effectively been doing this role uh, for us as best as you can, but with limited ability to carry it out, given that you weren't actually in it. Uh, and so this will hopefully allow you to have the opportunity to work directly with us and with all the relevant uh, players in, in county government and beyond to be able to move forward on what our very ambitious but very important uh, goals are to keep our residents safe. And so uh, congratulations uh, for that. And, you know, I appreciate the, uh, you know, fact that was mentioned earlier, both by planning and by you, uh, about being reactive, not being reactive, but being proactive, which I think, you know, today really is all about. Unfortunately, this briefing and this conversation is reactive. And we need to make this a regular part of our uh, policy making where it's proactive, uh, which is what I hope we can uh, move forward. And we really need to address this as the public health crisis that it is, uh, because uh, we you know, really just can't wait for deaths to respond uh, to this on a case by case, intersection by intersection basis. We will never keep up and we will have residents who die in the meantime. And while I really do appreciate and my office and myself personally advocated strongly for uh, the change mentioned earlier in several of the changes, but particularly at the Bethesda Trolley Trail on Tuckerman Lane, if we had done that before, I think Jennifer DeMauro would still be with us. And instead, her family, her community, uh, all of us are grieving her passing, and that's just one of uh, many examples. I'll turn to the evening of December 12th and uh, the morning of December 13th. It's the most difficult, devastating 24 hours I've ever experienced in my professional life. I hope to ever experience, ever in my career, that the community, I think, uh, you know, one of the most devastating 24 hours we've ever experienced. With uh, the evening of December 12th, Sophia Chen, nine-year-old, young girl who was struck by a bus, uh, Bradley Hills Elementary School student. The next morning, Ayal Haddad, 17-year-old Walter Johnson student, was crossing Montrose Road to try to catch the bus, facing life-threatening injuries, critical injuries. Same morning, Delegate Mark Corman and I had uh, worked together to we appreciate having uh, State Highway and uh, Andre and, and, and your team uh, looking at Old Georgetown Road. And I walked that along with Andre and others from uh, State Highway with Jay Castle's parents at the site where uh, Jay Castle uh, was hit and killed when he tried to swerve out of the way of obstructions in the public right of way, including recycling bins and trash cans, we believe, and, uh, and, and, and poles and other obstructions. And to the point that was made earlier by uh, by uh, Councilmember Hucker, uh, there was nowhere to go. There was no safe place uh, to be. Uh, Councilmember Reamer and Glass joined us, along with uh, State Highway. I appreciate the uh, the work that ha some of the work that has been done, the preliminary work of removing some of those obstructions to make it a little bit safer. But we need to do much of what uh, Councilmember Hucker was talking about before, which is to create a buffer to allow for safety for users of uh, that, that roadway. Um, I'll never forget walking along that roadway as we address these safety issues and in the aftermath of a 24-hour stretch of two collisions, one fatal, one life-threatening, uh, all involving children with the parents of a child who had been lost on the stretch that we were uh, looking at. I think it, it provides a window into the severity and the seriousness of the crisis uh, that we face. I can't begin to imagine the pain that they were facing, but I saw the look in their eyes, and I can't escape it, and I hope none of us can escape it uh, as we talk about these issues. And that's why I have focused so intensely, I think most of us, have, all of us have focused so intensely on, on addressing this on a case-by-case intersection by intersection, crosswalk by crosswalk basis, pushing SHA, pushing County Department of Transportation to make proven engineering improvements that we know could prevent the next tragedy. But we have an entire road network that is completely outdated. It was built mostly between the 1930s and the 1960s at a time when 
our communities looked much different, were being used much differently, and the goals of the infrastructure was for a far different purpose, not the livable, walkable, accessible communities we talk about that we want to live in, that we say that we're living in, and that we are trying uh, to create. And this has created a massive challenge, and frankly, an epidemic, not just for pedestrians and bicyclists, but for all road users, as we heard uh, about earlier. I mean, we don't talk about it enough that, you know, we had 15 drivers and three motorcyclists killed on our roadways as well. This isn't about protecting pedestrians and protecting bicyclists. This is protecting people, residents, human beings who are using our roadways in all different ways and currently are not nearly as safe as they need to be and as we want them to be. Uh, Wade, you mentioned earlier that, you know, one of the goals that you have, and I think the goal of this uh, conversation, should be making sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to Vision Zero across county government. And I think that's absolutely fundamental to the monumental task that's before us. Uh, I want to turn to page two of the county's Vision Zero Action Plan published in November of 2017. If you don't have it in front of you, I'll quote it, don't worry. There is a chart that details how Vision Zero and the safe system is approached that is the basis for Vision Zero differs from a traditional safety approach, the one that we have been using for almost 100 years. Under a traditional road safety approach, what causes the problem are non-compliant road users. Under a traditional road safety approach, the person or persons ultimately responsible are the individual road users. Under a safe systems approach, the approach that our county has formally adopted as our policy, as a Vision Zero policy, what causes the problem are not non-compliant road users. Under a safe systems approach, people make mistakes and people are physically fragile, vulnerable in crashes. Varying quality and design of infrastructure and operating speeds provides inconsistent guidance to users about what is safe use behavior. Not my words, this is the quote from the November 2017 adopted plan that is the county's official policy on road safety. Under a safe systems approach, quote, who is ultimately responsible? Under a safe systems approach, quote, there is a shared responsibility by individuals with system designers. System designers, that's us. We're the policymakers. We focus too much on the people on our roadways and not enough on the policies and the policymakers behind our roadways. Now I want to read you a tweet from the official Montgomery County, Maryland Twitter account that came on January 17th, the day after 32-year-old Brett Batten was struck and killed by a driver in a vehicle while trying to cross Rockville Pike, not far from here at Wooten Parkway, just outside my district. The tweet remains up today. The tweet reads, drivers stay alert for pedestrians, especially when it's dark. Pedestrians, use crosswalks when available and be as visible as possible by wearing light colors and using a reflector or a small flashlight. Safety is a shared responsibility. It doesn't reflect the policy that we've adopted as a county. So my question is, does anybody on this panel believe that this tweet is consistent with our own adopted Vision Zero plan that says when it comes to what the problem is and who is ultimately responsible? Take that as no. Another question. Does anyone on this panel believe that the solution to this epidemic is pedestrians wearing light colors, bright colors, or using flashlights when trying to cross the street? Take that also as a no. Additional question. Does anyone on the panel think Brett Batten, a constituent of mine, a Special Olympics participant who loved bowling, someone who people are currently describing as a gentle soul, someone whose death has devastated many people in our community. Does anyone here think that he as a pedestrian is to blame for his own death because he wasn't using a flashlight when he was trying to cross the street? Okay. County Executive Elrich said at his Vision Zero press conference yesterday that quote, if everybody did what these places were engineered for, we'd be fine, end quote. Does anyone think that Jake Castle, when he was trying to swerve out of the way of an obstruction on the sidewalk, or the driver who hit him weren't doing exactly what our roadways were designed for? If we're going to be serious about Vision Zero, then our county government must stop 
blaming the people who are using our roadways and start taking responsibility for the roadways that we're designing. We have to start focusing on what's causing the problem, not according to me, not according to what I think, but according to the policy that we've adopted as a county. The speed of vehicles, the fact that too many places, we have too many people that are vulnerable users, pedestrians and bicyclists predominantly, and that we aren't protecting them nearly enough as we should. Unless we can commit to truly understanding what's causing the problem and what is responsible for the problem, then I'm afraid we'll just keep having these updates with no progress and more tragedy. It shouldn't be about shaming individual actors or blaming individual users of our road base. It should be about taking responsibility, our responsibility, for making the changes that are needed to keep our residents safe. If we can't agree on what the problem is and what is responsible for the problem, then we aren't going to do the right things in order to solve them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rice, and might I remind my colleagues that we do have other things on the agenda, please. I hear you loud and clear, Mr. President. Um, I'm going to dispense with a lot of the platitudes and get right into it and pick up uh, where uh, Councilmember Friedson kind of left off. Um, so I'll ask a question. Does anyone on this panel think that it's safe for a person to stand in our median for long periods of time and put themselves at risk? Can I just mention that there are a lot of places where people have to stand in the median because there's no pedestri pedestrian refuge island when they're, I mean, I know what you're getting at, which is it, right. not that, right. but the yes. reality is. And thank you for that, Christy, absolutely. And, 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 but I'm talking about for hours on end. Does anyone feel as though that's safe? But yet we allow our homeless, or those who say that they're homeless, via the policies that we've enacted, both locally and state, to continue to allow people who we say are some of our most vulnerable to sit in those positions hour upon hour. And we've had a death, Richard Lee Cooper in Germantown, Maryland, who was homeless, who was a panhandler, who is on our heads because we allowed him to stay out there under the auspices of saying, well, we want to be fair and we want to be socially uh, woke when it comes to not forcing people to not be able to panhandle. Well, if we're going to get serious about Vision Zero, if we're going to say that we're protecting everyone, everyone means everyone. It means that our homeless and the people who are disparaged, who are looking for a hand up or a handout, need to also be protected. That's the reality. It doesn't just stop with those who we know. It doesn't just stop with those who go to a great school. It doesn't just stop with those that are children. It goes to everyone. So if we're going to be serious about it, let's be serious about it and stop playing around and actually start doing something about this. I want to do one last thing. Uh, uh, Assistant Chief Didon, um, when it comes to police enforcement, has the county executive, either in this past budget or in previous budgets, significantly enhanced the budget for, enforce, for traffic enforcement? Uh, short answer, no. That's what I thought. And, 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 and so um, from that perspective, if, again, we're going to be serious about talking about traffic and enforcement and enhancing all the things, Christy, to answer your question about whether or not the money is enough, heck no, it's not enough. It's not enough because we don't even give our police the additional money to do the enforcement that folks up here are asking for. But yet at the same time, we're asking to do all the other things in the community that we need in terms of protecting our public, public safety on all the other realms. So where do we expect it to come from, right? And so I just want to say that, again, if we're going to be real about this, let's make sure we put the budget behind it and put the appropriate resources there to make it happen so that we can do the traffic enforcement that's necessary. I will say one last thing, and that's to you, Mr. Smith, because I'm going to try and adhere uh, to the council president's timing. Your folks have been incredibly receptive to my office, so thank you. When it comes to some of the issues that have happened all the way dating back to the death of Christina Morris Ward in Germantown and changing that intersection to the students that got hit at Kingsview Middle School and changing that intersection, 
to then being proactive so that someone wouldn't get hit on Great Seneca and actually mowing some of those areas and trimming trees that were protruding into the sidewalks because of budget cuts that were reduced in terms of the actual timing in which we do that probably prevented some other folks who I saw personally and who even when folks went out to observe saw people walking into the street like you saw Christy with the person who was in the wheelchair who then reared into the street because they couldn't travel on the sidewalk. These things happen for other reasons besides just engineering. So we have to remember that as well. The budget cuts and the things that we do that we as the county and the state allow brush to be overgrown in areas so that people can't see and actually pull out into crosswalks, which then block the ability for people who can actually go through the crosswalks and have to then walk into the street. These are all things that, again, are affecting the efficacy of Vision Zero. So we have to be real about this as well. In thinking beyond just the engineering, that's certainly a part of it. I agree with Councilmember Friesen wholeheartedly. But there's practice, the practice that we do each and every day that also goes into this. And again, if we're going to be serious about this, like I've seen us be serious about affecting our homeless population and what we've been able to do when it comes to veterans uh, zero and getting to functional zero when it comes to veterans homelessness and almost you know when it comes to chronic homelessness, if we're going to be serious about it, we've got to have this multi-pronged approach. And a lot of it's got to be education as well, education on both sides, because I'll close with this. Honoring Christina Morris Ward's memory and her mother's advocacy for pedestrian safety and pedestrian uh, awareness, right? The reality is, that's right, you don't have to and never should have to wear light colors or carry a reflector or anything like that to be safe. You shouldn't have to. But we know the reality. I know the reality because I teach my daughters every day that walk. The reality is, is that unfortunately some people are not paying attention. Unfortunately, some people are distracted. Unfortunately, some people are speeding. People are doing the wrong things and will continue to do the wrong things. We cannot enforce ourselves out of it. And that's where the education piece comes in. So for anyone who wants to pretend that we don't have to do that other part, that we shouldn't do that other part, it's a key and integral part. And it saved one of my daughters from either being severely injured or killed right in front of my face. We've got to do the education piece as well. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilmember Albernoz. Thank you, Mr. President. I know we're over. This is obviously a critically important discussion. I will limit my comments to questions. Um, while obviously we do need to focus on the systemic issue, as Council Fritzen so eloquently stated, and there are a variety of steps that we need to take from a systemic approach across the entire county, I am curious as we've evaluated some of the collisions that have occurred recently, and I know. Assistant Chief Didone, that the department is still in the process of evaluating and assessing some of that, but what portion or can we assess what role distracted driving played in those particular collisions? In these particular collisions, we did not identify any contributing causes initially by the driver or the environmental change. And one of the things that we're doing differently, as was recommended, is we're not looking at fault. We're looking at those causes and we're collecting those clauses. The, the commonalities we saw that each crash occurred on a major state arterial roadway. The collisions occurred at night at the end or shortly after rush hour. There was adequate lighting, no environmental factors noteworthy, but not enhanced lighting. And one of the things the county executive talked about was adding LED lighting, the bright white lighting at intersections where their people are crossing and bus stops. It's a full philosophical change. Understanding the fact that you drive down the road, you see these yellow lights, yellow, yellow lights, and all of a sudden, where you have pedestrians, you see bright white neon football lights. It makes a big difference. Human nature, people want to cross there. Drivers can see a lot better. We're looking at that there. Pedestrians' ages were 75, 40, and 32, so we're talking adults. Um, pedestrians, were not in the crosswalk in two, but in the crosswalk at one, but possibly against the signal in that intersection. And um, as I said, there were no contributing causes initially identified in the preliminary investigation. These, these cases take about two months to reconstruct, and the findings go to the state's attorneys for final disposition. 
Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, all constituencies are particularly at risk when it comes to pedestrian safety, but some are disproportionately at risk. And I want to highlight our disability community. I had the opportunity to attend the Commission for People with Disabilities meeting recently, and 80% um, of the questions I received were pertaining to pedestrian safety. And there was a woman who I will never forget uh, who grew emotional, um, who was visually impaired and felt offended by the title of this initiative, Vision Zero. And so we do need to think through the marketing of this for a variety of reasons uh, to make sure that we are expanding the reach so that everybody feels inclusive and part of this important discussion. But my question relative to specifically our disability community is how are we incorporating their unique needs into planning? Uh, if you can give me some highlights, that would be helpful. And how, Mr. Wade, moving forward, um, are we going to incorporate our disability community in the ongoing conversation? Because I think it needs its own strategic plan, similar very much to what Council Member Navarro said, a special uh, plan and a strategic plan specific to our immigrant community. But if you could just respond sure. to that quickly, thank you. Sure, I would just say that, you know, we're in the pretty early stages of the pedestrian, ma pedestrian master plan, but we have engaged the commission of people uh, on people with disabilities in that effort, and we're going to continue to do so throughout uh, the, the planning effort. So. Can I also add to that, the PBTSAC just reached out this week as well to the Commission for People with Disabilities um, because there have been a lot of issues that have been raised, not just with like the overall planning, but with some specific treatments. And I think that some of the engineers are, are struggling with, you know, what, how, to, how to implement something that will, will work. Um, but, you know, hopefully that will help a little bit, some of those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. With Christy and working with the, the community, different communities together will be important. We've already had some sit, um, sit down meetings and outreach with uh, the engineers, myself, um, and other people with the commission, persons with, uh, commission on persons with disabilities um, to highlight their um, issues and make sure that we're reactive to them. Thank you. And I think a lot of those issues correspond to our aging community as well. So, and I know that's been at the forefront of folks' mind. Last question is. Um, there was a serious accident near my home on Connecticut Avenue that, thank God, didn't result in a death, but came about as close as it could have come to resulting in a death. And one of the recommendations was made, was made and I really need to um, commend our District 18 delegation for committing a community meeting and, and State Highways was there and answered questions and so was DOT. One of the recommendations was for a left-hand turn signal. Um, on that particular stretch of the roadway. When pretty straightforward recommendations like that that don't cost a lot of money that I do think make sense come forward, what process does state highways follow to follow up on recommendations like that? So part of that is, uh, so the rec just for my clarification, there was a recommendation from the council to from from b the residents that were there, um, but also from the delegation. Okay, so timeline timeline wise, we would look at the traffic, um, look at the pedestrian movements, as well as uh, what ramifications it would be for the traffic signal operations in the signal head, and try to craft uh, the best decision for that. But I'm going to let Derek. Help me answer that question. Thank you again. Uh, so the Connecticut Avenue, uh, I believe it's at Saul Road, Correct. the location that you're mentioning. We're, we're working with the community and we're working with Delegation 18, like you mentioned, on uh, improvements along the corridor. And to speak to the process standpoint, what we try to do once we receive a recommendation, we perform a comprehensive evaluation and we try to look at uh, all of some of the items that Tim mentioned uh, a few moments ago. But in terms of moving something like that forward, we try to, uh, if the recommendation uh, is to go forward, we want to move forward as quickly as possible and get that improvement through our design process and then ultimately uh, into construction as soon as, as soon as possible. Okay. All right, thanks. I'll defer questions directly to you guys afterwards because we have more to get to today. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. Thank you, Mr. President. I apologize. I had an, uh, another thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, we did um, 
many of us were contacted because there is a, a project happening right now, a demolition, the Ambassador Hotel, which is um, the intersection of Veers Mill Road and University Boulevard, and uh, SHA went ahead, I guess, and approved for there to be you know, closure, of course, of that particular um, sidewalk, but what's happening now is that residents are walking on University Boulevard, so if you could please make sure that you provide the appropriate pedestrian detour treatment there. Um, and again, I think this is just an example of what we really need to be super mindful that every time there are these particular kinds of projects, um, that this is something that is always included because our residents, you know, they don't have a choice. And so there are actual photos of people who are walking on University Boulevard. Um, and my staff can share that with you. We did share it with, with your staff, um, but they'll be happy to give you a printout uh, that shows the photo and, and, and all of this. So just wanted to flag that for you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hawker. A uh, few quick questions for AC Didone. Um, Tom, since you're here, um, if you go to the DOT website, there's a real clear process constituents can understand to get a speed bump or a stop sign, many other traffic calming devices. Um, why is it so hard to get a speed camera um, that MCP is in charge of? And why wouldn't you install them wherever the Civic Association and a council member is asking for them? Well, first off, on our website, there is clear indication of the process that goes through for a speed camera so any citizen can look. Any citizen can re request a speed camera location um, to be considered for the, and go through the process. Everything we've done is data driven. Uh, we don't take political requests because when we did the assessment in the national, um, when we started the program, we found out the most speed camera programs failed because they tried to honor political requests rather than going with a data driven approach. We've been identified as a national model by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety because we use a data-driven approach, and we make it consistent, and, and so a lot of locations are not included because we only have 34 speed cameras at this time that have to be rotated through 300 currently approved locations. There's not enough resources to put them where people want them because they want them. We put them where they need to be due to data assessments. Have you, have you requested more funding from the county executive if there are more speed cameras that now that are warranted, like you say? We are in the process of going out to a new RFP process. We hope to have that process completed by July of this year. It's been a long and tedious process. Every time we go through an RFP process, it takes over a year to accomplish. At the end of this RFP process through this contract, we hope to have double the number of red light cameras and double the number of speed cameras for implementation. Okay. Um, I think we ought to consider that in the Public Safety Committee, Mr. Chairman. Um, we have 1,100 officers. How many are in traffic enforcement versus how many are in patrol? I thought 1,300 was the request. How many officers do you have and what percentage are in traffic enforcement? We have approximately 1,300 officers mm -hmm. and then we have under 100 specifically assigned to full-time traffic duties. I don't know the breakdown for patrol and detectives. So fewer than 10 percent? Yes, sir. Why not assign more to traffic enforcement given the urgency of the problem we're talking about today? All I can tell you is this, is Chief Jones has taken over by his promotion of me to uh, assistant chief and the promotion of Dave McBain to traffic director. He is showing his commitment to traffic because for 15 years traffic did not get that kind of consideration. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chief Jones is looking to do a reorganization in July, so he is looking to explore. He is committed to traffic. I can't give you a commitment, but I can tell you traffic is a higher priority in Montgomery County Police today than it was years ago. I'm glad to hear that. I've been disturbed by the um, information about the tra district traffic squads that are often understaffed because of the detailing, sometimes down to two or three officers. We also have a central traffic plan that's looking to address that as well. And can you say what they've done like this the last week or two? I heard it. Yes, as a matter of fact, I can. The central traffic team I'll give you for the last four months, this is one traffic squad. The one traffic squad in four months did 168 details. By 168 details, we talked about 67 details during the morning rush hour when the, you have peak crashes. We did a 42 details, primarily pedestrian, in the middle of the day, and we did 59 details in the evening rush hour, which accounted for uh, 270 
2,775 traffic contacts and we wish we issued approximately 4,000 charges. So the police department in this central traffic squad is out there. We're demonstrating that this new approach is the right approach because we're targeting our enforcement efforts on data, hotspots, and doing sustained and saturated enforcement, which we've learned over the years is the correct way to doing it, is taking it out of the decisions at the district level and having one unified command mm -hmm. with a central vision dedicated to central tra to vision zero. So we're looking at putting all the pieces together and I think make it more efficient, more effective, and better job for our community. I'm glad to hear that commitment. If you could share the data with us, that would be really helpful. My pleasure. The letter I got from Chief Jones said that there had been 100 and, or, I'm sorry, 1,505 charges for pedestrian-related offenses in 2019 as of October. So that's only about 15 per officer um, if there's 100 officers dedicated to that. So right. I'm just giving you what we have from the central team. And then in addition to that for pedestrian safety, we did 1,900 work hours of pedestrian enforcement work and 400 details in 2019. So we're out there, but I, as I said in the Vision Zero Conference, we can do better. We have a plan, and with, under Chief Jones, I feel confident that we will do better. Looking forward to seeing the details. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Reamer, please. Finally, I'll be brief. Thank you. Um, the District of Columbia has transferred the traffic camera enforcement function out of the police department and to the Department of Transportation. Um, you know, I've just been frustrated by the pace of expansion. I know the state has some limitations in there, uh, Assistant Chief Dione, so there are some you know, bureaucratic uh, challenges. Nevertheless, I really think we ought to be doing the same thing. I, I think that you know, the fact that we heard from DOT today that they're only just starting to get some of the data that they need to respond with engineering changes after there's been incidents indicates you know, it just, it's not functioning the way it could, and uh, especially traffic camera enforcement. Um, I'm not going to take offense at the, uh, at, at terming it a political. Uh, you know, when we pass along requests from the community for safety enforcement, it, it's not political. I mean, it might be coming from an elected official, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, neither here nor there. But I, I think the slow pace, the bureaucratic resistance, the, the lack of progress to me is just unacceptable. And I believe that MCDOT would move faster. Uh, and, and I would really like the council to explore that. I think I might have mentioned that previously, but it would be a terrific topic to take up at t and &E and public safety joint uh, and, and explore this and see what might be involved in. Uh, because again, I, I just gotta say, if we wanted to stop all of this carnage, we could stop it. You know, it would be heavy-handed, but we could stop it. Enforcement would actually take care of this problem as well. Uh, that probably goes farther than the community is to be willing to support. But we could do a lot more than we're doing right now. Thank you, and I'm happy to explore it. But I do think there are state laws associated with this, which are necessary to keep in mind. And I believe you have to have a sworn officer actually uh, um, work with the uh, speed cameras and, and other uh, 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 visual uh, cameras that uh, that they have to be the ones to actually make certain that the that the uh, law has been that it's not uh, that the law has been violated and has not been uh, followed thank you all very very much for being with us we look forward to our continued conversation hopefully we will not have you back because of a tragedy but we will have you back because of their successes thank council you. president Katz can I make one date mm -hmm. announcement go ahead please um, on February 1st at 3 p.m. there will be a memorial for Jose Gillian in Aspen Hill um, people are meeting at 3 p.m. at the Aspen Manor Shopping Center and on February 8th there will be memorials for um, Brett Baden and Michael Gamboa starting at the IHOP in, in Rockville near First Street. So, Could you please repeat them one more time, though? I, I wasn't ready to write them down. I didn't sure. Realize what, I, we I can didn't send it to you over email, yeah, but if you could, February 1st, 3 p.m. in Aspen Hill, February 8th at 12.45 p.m. in Rockville for, both, um, for all three of the most recent um, traffic fatality victims. Thank you. If at all possible, I will try to be at both. Thank you very much for being with us. Next, we are going to move right along um, for our work session on Forest Glen, Montgomery Hills sector plan. And I believe uh, Ms. Dunn and Mr. Dr. Orlin will be discussing that with us. 
Yeah, but uh, yeah. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, the count, uh, the uh, chair I'll, will please I'll, begin. Uh, filibuster well, while our yeah. Don't filibuster. Team, uh, just do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, today. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. But we're going to ask everyone to please clear the room so that we can continue our meeting. Thank you. All right. So, welcome, Chairman Anderson, Gwen Wright. Um, let me just start. I don't know that we're going to get to the transportation piece today. Um, so maybe we could just start with a little bit of expectation about how far we can really get. Um, that said, I think there was a, you know, a lot of agreement in the committee recommendation around issues that are, are uh, you know, complicated. So perhaps this will be somewhat smoother. Um, but. We're going to start with land use. We'll get we'll get as far through that as we can. If we can get all the way through that, it'd be great. Council President will decide if there's a hard stop and so forth. Um, there are you know there are significant topics of discussion in both transportation and land use. There are some decisions uh, that uh, you know people will uh, consider carefully. Um, so. <clears throat> I think we'll just we'll we'll uh, turn. Excuse me, but Glenn, yeah. can you help them with the? Glenn, can someone help them with the? Uh, with the yeah, with the presentation with the slides. So are there yeah, are there slides? How, how Pam? How is this gonna? How do we do this here? We could we walk through the packet? Or is there a presentation? Or is that context? You know, if if there's a question, there's there's you have visualizations. Okay, that's what I was yeah. assuming. Uh, I was basically gonna walk the council through the packet. Great. All right. So um, why don't we do that? I could do it myself, but I think I'll, I'll turn it to you to, to walk us through. Um, but I'll try to keep the floor as, as, you know, as a committee recommendation here. Great. Um, so I'm going to start just on the second page with a staff report uh, for the land use zoning, um, historic preservation, parks and open space, urban design. Those components are going to be covered in um, the material that I will review with you right now. Um, the plan Actually, wait, area sorry, let me pause you here. I want to make some prefatory comments. Um, this, is a, this is a good plan. You know, this is a long time coming. Um, I think many of you uh, have had a lot of history. I think many many of us in this room have had a lot of history with this community, and and pushing hard for uh, changes in the built environment. This is um, whether you're, we're talking about Forest Glen and and development on that metro parking lot, or the tunnel, and how that relates to land use, um, you know, or down into the shopping centers, where there is so much community support for for change in those shopping centers to create a walkable, you know, more um, friendly environment where people feel like it's a it's an environment where they might want to spend some time, you know, rather than kind of get in and get out. Uh, I think presently it's really a get in and get out kind of environment. Uh, it's some of the most, I think, heavily impacted infrastructure. You know, you, if, you, if you walk Georgia Avenue uh, on, in, in Montgomery Hills, like you kind of can't believe just how intense it is being there in that environment with the volume of traffic and the, the, the condition of the sidewalks and the roadway and just everything. Um, it is a really difficult place. Uh, businesses do thrive there, uh, you know, in, in many, many do, often as regional, more regionally serving businesses. You know, people come a long way for bagels and they come a long way for uh, bunt cakes, um, you know, at least more than more than just around the corner. Um, uh, nothing bunt cakes, you know, aquariums, stores, so on. Um, so th there is a flower in the desert here. You know, you have you have uh, businesses that are serving, but that presents a challenge for us in terms of our expectations about change. We have to keep in mind that as we set the zoning framework for this plan for the future. The property owners there have generally, it looks looks to us, uh, rent-paying tenants, and so the incentive to tear down a successful commercial center and replace it with something bigger, you know, at what point that becomes uh, a, a smart investment, is is one of the underlying challenges here. You know, everybody wants to see change, but Aldi's just came in and and. You know, it seems to be doing quite well. And like, if you're the owner of that center, 
would you would you be so in such a hurry to tear down you know a center that has a thriving new tenant you know grocery store so these these are some of the you know underlying challenges that we face the some of the more exciting and i hopefully near term elements will be the the georgia avenue reconfiguration um, there's a fair amount of public land, getting to the topic of housing, there's a fair amount of public land in this, house, in this plan. And uh, we zoned some of it very aggressively for housing. Um, we, we really wanted to kind of push the envelope and, uh, you know, get as much as hopefully we could get through the county negotiated partnerships with presumably nonprofit, although not necessarily, but uh, under the conditions that we have set you know, it seems certainly likely that it's going to have to be, uh, you know, a strong nonprofit element. Um, but uh, this this brings this will bring to conclusion, uh, at least as far as what is a, allowable, uh, a, a a decades long question about what kind of development is going to happen at the Forest Glen Metro, what kind of housing we're going to allow there. Years ago, there was outrage over the townhouses that were proposed, uh, and we've gone quite a bit beyond that. We did also recommend rezoning through or applying a floating zone to a small segment of single family housing units that are within sight uh, of the Forest Glen Metro on Georgia Avenue, which is heavily impacted by traffic as a, one of the county's, you know, largest arterials. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here and it, uh, you know, really uh, I'm pleased with the plan. There's an exciting new park concept at the, uh, 16th Street, um, you know, that green state highway buffer. Um, and, uh, uh, and so there are uh, many, many details. It was, it was great working with my colleagues on the committee uh, through this process. All right, I think we're all ready now. Great. Um, and just to give you context, this plan really is about um, the corridor through Montgomery Hills and Forest Glen. It starts up at Dennis Avenue and Georgia Avenue. Um, basically a block on either side of Georgia Avenue as you move down through Forest Glen, through the Beltway Interchange, down through Montgomery Hills, and then through the Woodside District, which goes down to Spring Street and Georgia Avenue. So that sort of sets the context. It is a corridor plan. It does look at properties on either side of Georgia Avenue, but does not go deep into the neighborhoods to investigate possible changes in land use. So as we go through the packet, if council members have a question about a specific property, we will be getting to you know, parcel would be going like group by group. They're, they're sort of grouped into small groups of properties. So, you know, ask your question at the time. I, I, I think Council President, I would recommend that, that if we have questions about specific properties, we take them up as we go. I think that makes sense. Okay, and, and to start off though, we do have a few that are what I would think of as our general recommendations. They apply to the, the plan area in general. They are not about any particular property. Um, the first one on the page two of the report is about urban design. Um, there were two primary goals related to urban design in the plan, and they were supported by several recommendations. Um, the committee reviewed these, and then they support the recommendations rather than delineating all of them because it was unanimous support of those recommendations uh, by the committee um, for the planning board draft. Although I did want to bring up the fact that the draft does recommend in two separate places undergrounding utilities and um, yeah. The committee chair, Reamer, do believe that that is a really important point that the plan needs to emphasize. I think it is something I've heard a lot about from the community. It plays a little bit into the next page. You know, we had some dispute about how much additional requirements we will put on parcels there. And, uh, you know, I certainly think undergrounding utilities would be profoundly, uh, would be transformational for the built environment there. Um, and uh, I wanted to put our weight behind that. Uh, as a as a as an aspiration, uh, there's a lot more to do. I don't know that the private sector will be able to afford to do that uh, by itself. But uh, if if we could make that happen somehow through this process, it'd be a big step forward. So if there's uh, no questions on that, I'll continue moving. Um, the next one is more general recommendations for historic preservation. Again, the plan set up. Um, numerous, it had a couple goals and then set up numerous recommendations and the, there are just some recommended tweaks to those. Um, within the goals there was one that really was more of a, an implementation issue, something that, the, that could be recommended um, as part of the review process or as part of the um, process where properties may come forward for designation. So it was moved from a goal just to a recommendation, it's not a big change. Um, and then one of the goals referenced um, its aspiration with respect to the county and we're just bringing that down in and say this should be with respect to the plan area. 
Um, and the committee was unanimously supportive of just those minor changes, but I want the council to be aware of them. Um, the next one is uh, into the environment. Um, and the environment really covers um, three areas. One is green cover, one's water quality, and the third is air quality and carbon emissions. Um, and with respect to green cover, the committee did have a, um, a modification to what was recommended in the plan. The language in the plan implies that it's um, requiring a 35% green cover um, under redevelopment of the commercial properties, um, which I think was more of a the way that the um, typical that area of the plan was phrased made the, the reading of it appear to be a requirement. Um, in the recently passed Bethesda downtown plan, there was also the 35% green cover, but it was a strong recommendation and it, it had very clear language that made it clear that it was a recommendation, not a requirement of redevelopment in that area. So the committee agreed with um, making sure that the language in this plan is similar and make sure that it is a recommendation and not a requirement. Because we wanted to be flexible here, recognizing that in downtown Bethesda, property can go to 30, you know, 300 feet. You know, here, that we don't have anything like that kind of allowance. Um, and, and from an environmental perspective, the best thing we could do would be to redevelop this property because we would get storm an water. immediate stormwater benefit. Um, and, and changes that we put, you know, the more requirements we put onto the private property here, the less likely that it is we'll get redevelopment because you change the economics of the equation. So we felt like, you know, we were we were at odds with ourselves. Uh, you know, we want to support the possibility of reinvestment and, and redevelopment of the property, and, we, and, and so we ought to be we, we shouldn't put the strictest possible standard, which the initial plan really called for, which was you know Bethesda. Uh, uh, coverage requirement, but it was even stricter, I guess, because right. it was a requirement. So. Correct. Correct. Um, the next part under the green cover, though, and, and another recommendation is related to soil volume, which is how much area which the canopy trees along the street have to grow and um, flourish. Um, and in the plan, there was a recommendation for a minimum um, soil volume of between 800 and 1,000 cubic feet and looking at other plans that had been approved in the recent um, year, Bethesda plan, the Littonsville plan, the recommendation had been 600 cubic feet. Also you look at the street sections to see how much space is being allowed in that tree panel um, that's being proposed. You know the right of way along Georgia Avenue is going to be um, challenging to redevelop with uh, bicycle lanes, tree canopy trees, sidewalks, medians, all of it. Um, so staff had recommended and the um, committee agreed two to one um, to stick with the 600 cubic feet that had been recommended in both the Bethesda plan and in the Littonsville plan and to not increase the minimum soil volume um, for this plan. It sounds like a small issue, but this is the kind of thing that can force an, a, an entire building to move its footprint back from the street, you know, because you're not leaving enough room for the tree zone. So maybe a little bit of a smaller tree would be appropriate in this location. All right. Questions. Uh, the next um, environmental um, recommendation topic area that the plan covers is water quality. There are numerous um, recommendations related to environmental site design, stormwater management, all to promote um, improved treatment of stormwater runoff, and the committee agreed um, unanimously with the planning board recommendations in this area. Um, the next is air quality and carbon emissions. Um, again, there were numerous recommendations to really get at improved air quality for this area, um, support uh, a lower carbon emission and carbon footprint, um, and with respect to that, the committee agreed with those recommendations unanimously. Um, this brings us to the fourth page of the report and to the parks, trails, and open space. And again, this is the recommendations that are broad for the whole plan with regard to parks, trails, and open space, not the specific property-specific park recommendations. Um, this is not property specific recommendations right yet? Right here, no. Okay. This was just these broad ones. Um, and again, the committee was unanimously um, supportive of the broad plan wide recommendations regarding parks, trails, and open space. Um, but now we are going to enter into the property specific recommendations, and we are going to do it by district. Um, as Councilmember Reamer mentioned, there are three districts there's the Forest Glen district, goes from Dennis Avenue to Forest Glen Road. Uh, there's the Montgomery Hills District, which starts at Forest Glen and goes down to um, 16th Street. And then there's the uh, Woodside District starting at 16th Street and going to Spring Street. So 
the first set of properties, the plan deemed uh, the Dennis Avenue Medical Cluster. All right, why don't we raised. pull up a graphic if we could. Can you pull up a map and oh, show us what buildings um, we're talking about? It'll take me a minute to do it. I have to, I don't think they, what, do you guys have? Okay, can you do that? Okay, so they'll pull that um, an aerial up. Um, but there and you also, if you have your plan, can look right. at pages four and five. This is of the bound plan. Yeah. And is it in the packet as well? I didn't copy the maps because of the reproduction in the, would be kind of difficult. Um, but if you do have your plan on pages four and five, it's the topmost of part of the map. It Circle page 20 in the packet is a map. Okay. Okay, here we are. The screen is up. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, so there are three properties that make up what the plan deems the Dennis Avenue Medical Cluster. It's the Birkeland Medical Center. That's the property that's right at the corner of Georgia Avenue and um, Dennis Avenue. There's the medical, um, there's the, what's called the Doctors Medical Park East. It's the white buildings that are just south of there along Georgia Avenue on the east side of Georgia. And then if you go on Dennis, turn the corner, there's the county-owned um, Dennis Avenue Health Center. But we'll take them in order because there is a zoning recommendation for each one. Um, for the Dennis, or for the Berkeley Medical Center, it's currently zoned R60. It had been approved as a medical center as a special exception. Um, and in conversation with the planning staff, the property owners would like to have mixed use zoning on this site because it provides them with the opportunity to have a little bit of retail added, a coffee shop or something for the patrons of those medical offices. And under their current special exception in R60, they can't, they can't make those slight modifications to their, to their clientele. So um, the planning staff had recommended a mixed use zone for this site. Um, at the same time, when we took the tour and the committee toured the entire area, one refrain was, and we had recently heard from um, the COG estimates and the need for housing in Montgomery County, is there a way when we look at each of these properties, can we consider that we are really maximizing the potential for residential if it exists? So um, for this property, it's, um, if you look at page five, there is a table, um, but it shows what's allowed under current zoning, what's allowed under proposed zoning, which would be the planning board draft, and then what's allowed under an alternative um, recommendation, which would be to allow as much residential FAR as there is commercial FAR, which would then equal total FAR. It's just slightly increasing the residential density. Um, and what, that has two benefits. One is if there's no redevelopment right at all, here. but the existing right. site oh, um, has potential for some development to be added to it, it would allow the Pam, additional development. Again, you're talking about the top left, or when you mentioned the zoning, are you talking about all of them? Not that one, it's the top toward the left, yeah. The one on the corner right at Dennis. Yeah, that, so and presently we're talking about that. And what, It's what called we'll the Berkeland Medical Center. Berk, so it's called Berkeland. And it's just equalized. And it's just saying it has a total density recommendation, it had a commercial density recommendation, those were equal, and now this recommendation from the committee is let's increase the residential to equal both commercial and total. So it has the most flexibility if it does redevelop. But there's successful doctor's offices right now, and what they're asking for right. is a coffee shop, so. Right, I mean, they may add no residential, but right. even at that, they're not fully built out on their site. Mm -hmm. So it just provides that flexibility. Yep. That they could come forward. Um, is there any questions on that one? All right, the next one's the Medical Park East. It's the one that's straight down right there, the um, below it along Georgia Avenue. And it's the same situation. It was approved as a special exception in the R60 zone. It has a recommendation for mixed use zoning. And it has the same recommendation from the committee, which is to increase that residential density to give it full flexibility and redevelopment. But not, the total density is not changing. Can, can you? And is that what, that's on the corner of Medical Park Drive? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Medical Park Drive and Georgia Avenue. And white uh, is that white still building. On, is that still on four? What page are you on in the book? Um, if you turn, um, it it starts at the bottom of five, the explanation, and there's a data table for it at the top of page On the packet, page five. The sta not not, the, not okay. the master plan. All right. All right. We, we're making it confusing again. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm not going to really refer much to the plan. I didn't bring my plan. You're going to use, use the, the packet. We're going to well, use, use the packet, packet and the map. We'll keep doing that. Okay. All right. 
Do you have any questions on that change? All right. Um, and then the third property in this medical center area is the Montgomery County um, Dennis Avenue Health Center. And that's where the tour bus um, actually turned around to get started on the tour. And there's a very large parking lot there. Um, and the idea looking at this property is could there really be the advantage of the county-owned property providing more housing um, in the county? And um, as part of the review of the plan, Councilmember Jawando wrote a memo to his committee members um, and recommended an increase in density on this site um, and an increase in height. And the increase in height really came about as a conversation with the committee who wanted to make sure that well, I think I think the whole committee wanted to increase the height and density to allow for a meaningful housing project, and Juando came up with quite a recommendation, and uh, so we got behind that. Yes, yes, the committee had already been talking about this as a uh, an idea, um, and then so Councilmember Juando followed it up with a memo, um, and in addition to that, recommending that 30 percent of the units be provided as regulated affordable housing. 15% at the MPDU level and 15% at people whose income is below 50% of AMI. Which would presumably limit the, you know, that means you're not going to sell the property for anything. You're probably, uh, anyway, keep on going. Right. Um, so you're saying that's county-owned? And this is county-owned county property. It's county-owned so probably be a public-private yeah. partnership. Right, exactly. So the county would control whether it sells Correct. or not. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that, that's the yeah. point. Is like you're not. If you did a partnership, you're not likely to get a payment, much of a payment for the right to build there. And I think this is a theme you're going to see throughout all of the recommendations that where it is county owned, there is a higher MPDU affordable requirement, and that was again a, an idea of Council Member Jawando's. Okay. Well. Let's just say it was a lot of our idea, but he, he wrote it down. <laughs> right. Sure. <laughs> Council um, Member uh, Navarro. Right. So I just wanted to kind of bring us all um, to the same page in terms of the resolution that we adopted, the COG resolution, because this undergirds that particular action, is that wherever we find opportunity, especially when it comes to you know, county-owned yes. property, that we would try to maximize that right. because if not, we're never going to get to the goal. So I, you know, yes. so I'm pleased that so the Fed important. committee has, you know, um, really truly taken that into account. This is the only way we're going to be able to do anything. And I guess my only question was in terms of the um, property that we, I mean, the building that we have there, the health center, um, is that is that part of the recommendation, or are we just looking at the surface and whatever land is? Right. I, uh, the health center was only built in 2016, so the right. recommendation was made um, and evaluated looking at can it really fit the additional density on the rest of this property. And there was a discussion about structured parking but not, not underground, you know, surface structured parking, and then putting the units on top. Um, and that's where the conversation height came in to make sure that you could really fit this on the property um, and get those housing units. Including leveraging the, the structure that's already there. Is that what you're saying? I think it would actually just be making it compatible with the structure there because it's a brand new building. We did not assume that the current structure will be torn down. No, no, I, I wasn't mm -hmm. thinking about that. I was thinking about, you know, as we talk about not just housing production, but then some of our even environmental conversations about like solar panels, mm -hmm. uh, that if in a situation like this where we can maximize the use of our, you know, publicly owned land, right. that even though there is a structure, you know, to think through what else could we leverage that structure. Um, as well, this is just low-hanging fruit, so I'm just wondering if that was considered. Yeah. But I did just but want to I say, the, the, the comments you just made there about the importance of using public land and being aggressive with public land uh, is one of the big uh, points that I think, you know, the COG resolution made that clear. Some recent academic studies have made that clear. I recently learned that Paris has been successful over the last few years in doubling its annual housing production uh, substantially through financing reforms, figuring out how to get more affordable financing into the market, public land, really being aggressive with public land, and then some targeted zoning reforms to remove impediments to, to building new housing. I think those are all areas that we need to be executing on. And so we, we tried to go uh, as big as we could, frankly, on public land in this plan um, with, with one exception where we call for a park because we felt like that was a missing piece. But the rest of the public land, you know, we, we, we 
set a maximum envelope knowing that the county would be in the decision-making seat uh, to actually decide truly what would happen there. Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, I wanted to say that as well. I think the comments that are, are, were just made are really important. One, uh, we just built this building in 2016, and I think it highlights a missed opportunity like so many other missed opportunities that we can't afford to keep doing, which is this is a brand new building with a huge sprawling parking lot that was built, and that is just not the way we can continue to move forward. And so I saw this plan as a key way of operationalizing the commitment that this council has repeatedly been making at, with the COG uh, resolution, but beyond that with, with the, the, the uh, policy decisions and statements that we've made to send a signal of what our expectations are and what our expectations must be in terms of the leveraging of county-owned public lands in order to achieve our ambitious goals and the major needs that we have in our community. And I think this no better demonstration of that was taking the bus tour and I raised the question of how is it that a county that is as aggressive as we have been and as serious as, as we are trying to be on our environmental goals and on our housing goals have a modest building in a huge sprawling parking lot and you know, viewing that as achieving our policy goals when we know we have to leverage uh, our assets. And so that did become a theme uh, as part of it. It started on the bus tour when I uh, you know, raised the fact that I didn't think that this was nearly as ambitious as it could be, should be. And the fact remains, of course, that the county executive, this one or a future one, will ultimately control the disposition of public properties. But this was an opportunity to send a signal of what the expectation is of this council, which I don't think the committee started with. I think the committee was reflecting what the full body has been repeatedly saying uh, over and over. And I think we documented it and we put it into this plan, which I think is an important signal to set that policy expectation moving forward for all of the public lands and facilities that we have. And then last point on this comment, uh, comment on this point, uh, point on this comment. Um, yeah, this is going to be something we're going to need to build and grow from. Like this plan, I think, uh, was a learning process or an expectation setting process. Like we need to get a lot more aggressive about public land and building housing. And I think there's going to need to be a variety of initiatives over the next several years that executes on that. I mean, we did it actually in Veers Mill. The Veers Mill corridor, uh, we're quite aggressive on public property as well. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've, we're, we're, we're working our way, but I think we're also seeing that making something allowable isn't yet enough. You've got to, you've got to go far beyond that. We're going to need to go far beyond that as well. But uh, we, were, we were really sticking to our guns here and saying we, we need to be a lot more assertive about public land. Good, good policy framework, because this, this, I mean, this is big picture, crucial, mm -hmm. important stuff. Like, you know, honestly, this is like one of the big issues right now we're all grappling with, so. Um, so unless the committee has um, any recommended change to this, I'm going to move forward. Um, and the next three properties are all residential, and they are the properties that are on the west side of Georgia Avenue. It starts with um, three garden apartment complexes. One is called the Fields of Silver Spring. The next one, one further south, is called the Belvedere Apartments. And then the third one, a little further south down Georgia Avenue, is called the Forest Glen Apartments. All three of those are apartment com garden apartment complexes um, that were built in 1947. Um, the zoning on the Fields of Silver Spring and on the Belvedere Apartment were recommended to be reconfirmed at R10 zoning. And R10 zoning is qu quite dense. It's not so much in this case about density, but R10 zoning is really designed to have um, very large setbacks and it allows 100 feet in height, which I think we believe in this location seems a little out of place. Um, and the real thing to look at for me in this and um, thinking about it was that the Forest Glen Apartments had already come into rezoning through the local map amendment process to the council and the council has already approved for them a certain zoning which was CRT zoning. It allowed MHP to go in and to really rebuild that apartment complex with very affordable housing. So taking that as a guide to say if uh, the Fields of Silver Spring needed to redevelop or if the Belvedere needed to redevelop, what would it take? Well, if we really want affordable housing, we want to keep it. Um, I understand the need for preservation, but we know with something this old, that's going to be a challenge. 
So these are slightly different. The Fields of Silver Spring currently is a tax credit project um, that will be in place until 2043. But again, it's a very old structure. Um, so if it needs to redevelop before then, or even at the end of that tax credit time frame, this plan may not have been revised yet. Um, and so the idea here would be, rather than changing anything about what their current situation is based on, the committee um, has recommended that uh, the master plan recommend a floating zone that's, um, that would accommodate the type of development that's being requested at the Forest Glen apartment. So there's um, a floating zone recommendation on this garden apartment. The next one, the Bel Belvedere, um, isn't under the same tax credit program. There's no regulated affordable housing units there today. And again, it was built in 1947. So we're anticipating in the next 20 to 30 years, the need for this property to redevelop is probably pretty high. And so the recommendation of the plan here is um, to change its zoning and to give it something similar to the, what is being recommended for the Forest Glen Apartments, the one that MHP is redeveloping. Um, and for all three of these, um, the recommendation under redevelopment would be for them to provide 15% um, of the units as moderately priced dwelling units. Um, for the Fields of Silver Spring, there's um, the recommendation to add 5% market affordable units for up to 30 years, which is something similar that we did in Beers Mill because that property is quite large. It's almost nine acres. Um, for the Bella Belvedere, it's much smaller, so that, that piece isn't there. But there is a recommendation for these to um, also redevelop with 25% of the units as two bedroom. Because today, these, these garden units do provide um, apartments that are quite large. So in redevelopment, requiring that a quarter of them be two bedroom um, would be a reassurance in the future that we don't get one in two, just one in efficiencies. Um, so I don't know if you want to take any of those separately or you're okay in general with the concept and you're okay with the zoning for all three complexes. Good, uh, you know, important housing resource here, um, and uh, you know, a zoning put in recommended here that would uh, allow really uh, aggressive redevelopment with with a lot of affordable. Yeah, and it does increase the potential number of units on all three of these properties, which is again in line with where the council's been headed with housing. All right. Um, there is one place though in the Forest Glen apartments. We were contacted. I think it was right before the third work session um, regarding by MHP who is redeveloping um, that property concerned with the sort of the phrasing of some of the environmental recommendations in the plan for that site. Um, they already have an approved preliminary forest conservation plan um, and they have other approvals that will come forward. Um, and felt that maybe the language was a little stringent. They were a little concerned, could they meet it? Um, and it didn't necessarily match with their current uh, preliminarily approved conservation plan. So I contacted planning staff who reviewed the recommendations and have um, offered the changes to the recommendations that you'll see on the top of page 10. So planning staff has um, agreed that these changes are acceptable to them and are in line with what they're looking at for that property as they already have things in review. And the committee was okay with that. And the committee, uh, I took a poll of the committee and they were unanimously in support of it as well. I just wanted to bring that to your attention. So this is a MHP, is the yes. property owner. They want yeah. to redevelop, but uh, they, they felt that they needed a little bit of flexibility. Correct. In order to achieve the goal. Correct. All right. Thank you. Um, the next one is the Forest Glen Metro Station parking lot. If you're in your staff report or packet, it's on page 10. Um, the planning board recommended a zoning of CRT uh, with a 2.5 FAR, um, both for commercial and residential as well as total, and a height of 120. Um, I know that you'll recall from the public hearing, we did hear from community members that live in the Americana Finmark. They are concerned with the height of 120 feet. They would prefer to see it lower at 75 feet. Um, we also heard from other community members who didn't comment on the height, but who definitely commented on their interest and excitement in the fact that they live in the Forest Glen area and they would love to see redevelopment of that parking lot. Like to them, that is um, a real benefit to their community to have something walkable that they can access. Um, the committee talked about this just for context when the Grosvenor plan was done, again, on top of a metro site with structured parking or parking lot that was getting redeveloped, garden apartments near it. Part of that site got 300 feet in its zoning. So 120 is not um, a crazy height that's out of context for what we've done on other metro sites and certainly not um, with respect to this neighborhood. Um, so 
Now, this was a this is one of the hot button issues of the plan, no question about it. Um, and we certainly heard uh, from the Americana Finmark community, um, and you know they're less than pleased with the 120 feet height. Uh, but uh, you know, I I certainly felt, and I think the committee felt that. When we're talking about property, it's right on top of Metro. Uh, that we we just have to go. Um, we have to really think big. And uh, with that, we would be able to get amenities and improvements. And um, you know, generally speaking, this is this is the direction we're going. I, I have to say, I'm. I don't know that allowing this is going to result in in the development happening. I, I'm not sure that high-rise construction uh, is going to be financeable. Um, we, 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 I think we've got some bigger challenges that we have to understand even to get this done. But at least this is allowing it to be to be built. Um, you know, they could come in and do mid-rise, you know, without any stick belt, without any problem. But we're we want high-rise here, and that's. Uh, that's a much more expensive proposition, um, but you know that's that's really what we ought to be doing on top of metro properties. So um, again, we've come a long way from the days uh, 15 years ago when a townhouse community was considered to be too much for some. Um, and I do respect and appreciate the Americana Finmark was not saying don't develop here. They were saying, right. you know, we just prefer a, a somewhat more modest size. Um, but I think we, we felt from a policy perspective that uh, metro sites, we needed to be um, thinking big. And it's not too much. It's not out of character. It's not going to overwhelm anybody. Um, but we've got we to go a little bit further. All right. Um, and I'll just note, for the same property, there's a recommendation for 15% of the units to be MPDUs and for 25% of the units to be two-bedroom units in redevelopment. All right. All right. Um, the Forest Glen Medical Center is right across Georgia Avenue from uh, basically that intersection. Um, it also was um, a medical center that was approved uh, on R60 zoning through special exception. Um, it was constructed in 1967. Um, it's multiple properties that make up that, that site. Um, and the plan has recommended that it have the same zoning as on the Metro Center site, uh, a CRT of 2.5 um, for both total commercial residential and a height of 120. Um, there's also a recommendation that would have 15% MPDUs under redevelopment. Um, the committee also had a discussion about um, looking at requiring workforce housing on this property since the county will be investing a lot of money to be putting a tunnel of access right to the metro for this property. Um, and one change I think that uh, I'll recommend here on the, um, on the fly is um, to remove rather the recommendation that refers to workforce housing and put in a percentage of units, say it's 10 percent, but make it affordable to households earning um, a minimum of 100 percent of AMI. Um, Plans are very, very long, and we're not sure that the workforce housing will be referred to in the code um, for that same period of time in the same way. Um, but we know that if we say that we want 10 percent of the units of four of a people earning at a minimum 100 percent of AMI, um, that's not tied to a program, and that we'll get those units. So I would make that change. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. I would suggest we take that without objection, unless there's a so again, just to be clear, workforce is a word that whose definition could change over time based on county policies. This is being explicit about what it is, 100% AMI for that additional layer on top of MPDUs. Correct. Um, and the only other uh, piece that's really a, a thing that the committee spent some time discussing for this property um, is the wooded area that's to the north of this site, uh, uh, sometimes referred to in the plan as the remnant forest. Um, and the plan had strong language that recommended that the force remain sort of in that same footprint, in that location. And after a lot of discussion with the planning board um, and each other, uh, they've made a recommendation, um, as you can see, it's at the top of page 11, that they, re they respect the 1.24 acres of the remnant forest, but would like to have the flexibility on the site to locate an area of equivalent environmental benefit and that has access to the community. 
Okay, so you, I, I think everyone's probably familiar with this uh, vegetated area. You know, you drive on Georgia Avenue and you see it, and it 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 is perplexing. I think to some extent. Apparently, it is, uh, you know, a parcel that has not been developed since I guess it was logged. You know, years ago. Um, it, uh, it whether there is more value in preserving that specific. Uh, vegetation or trying to, you know, the, the condition of it is very poor. It has been overrun for years with vines and, and low and weak bed maintenance. So we were basically just going to provide a general guidance to the planning board. You know, there there is an environmental resource here. As you proceed through redevelopment, you know, do what do what you feel as you can do to uh, continue to have trees and, and forest, forestation. If you look across the street in Americana Finmark, you'll see there's a lot of trees, actually. It's, it's heavily treed. Uh, you, you notice that from Georgia Avenue. You know, it, it is definitely possible that this development on the other side could proceed with a nice strategy for trees. But whether it has to be, we're not saying, saying it does not have to be those specific uh, you know, mulberry trees that are there or whatever they are. Okay, and then loosening that up allows for a potential connection to adjacent properties, which is, you know, the next, is that the next? That's, that is the next. So um, the next focus in the plan are the properties at 9909 Georgia Avenue and 9820 Woodland Drive. Uh, at the public hearing, you heard um, testimony that a property owner for those Two properties, they back on to each other. I don't know if we have something that can show it. Can I just um, pause you a quick second for my colleagues? If you have a question, please let the council president know. I'm, I'm not, I don't manage that. So, okay, he's okay. watching. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the, those two properties, they back to back each other. There's a property owner who doesn't live in either property but rents them both out. Um, they provide housing. Um, Sorry, can you say that again? Start over. Okay, there are the. Can you zoom in, please, a little bit? Thank the you. The two properties that border the wooded area, um, that house there that, that uh, faces Georgia, and then there's the house facing Woodland Drive. One property owner owns both of those as rental properties. That property owner came to the public or sent a representative to the public hearing requesting that they be considered for rezoning to a commercial residential neighborhood zone, that they get rezoned as part of this planning process that would make them compatible with the medical center site next door. You also heard in public testimony at the public hearing from the property owner whose house um, is neighboring the Woodland Drive property um, who, who was not interested and not happy about the prospect of having her neighboring properties rezoned to a mixed use zone. Um, part of the issue here is that this wasn't something that the planning staff or planning board reviewed or discussed. The prospect of requesting this floating zone or I'm sorry, just even the mixed use zone itself about it being a floating zone um, came up at public hearing. Um, so the committee spent time talking about what would be appropriate um, for this area and given the amount of process required for a rezoning, um, the committee recommended that these two properties could uh, have a floating zone recommendation in the master plan. Um, and then the committee had a further discussion about the health of the rest of the block and its locality close to a metro station, would it be appropriate for the block itself to get a recommendation for a mixed-use floating zone? And that's the recommendation that they made. All right. So the recommendation is um, that a floating zone uh, is applied to this area. Now we could have just rezoned it, if if uh, you know if we were so inclined, um, so that those property owners would immediately have the right to. You know, the vision of the floating zone is essentially a more modest scale. It's not, this is not 100 feet height, right? But Pam, what is the floating oh. zone? Uh, uh, the recommended rezoning is for a C, uh, CRN, commercial residential neighborhood, of a 1.5 FAR, which is actually for housing is quite small, um, with no commercial density at all. Uh, so 1.5 residential and a height of 55 feet. All right. So you're talking, you know, what we call missing metal, it's, it's you know, it could be a small apartment, it could, you know, buildings, what's that? It could that? be quads. Quad yeah, plex, like quad plex, two over twos, it could be triplex, it could be duplex. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know, 
but it's in the less intensive use. I mean, clearly, like, an intensive thing to do here would be to make this all, you, know, you could go a lot farther than this, I'll say yes. that. Um, but, um, you know, I just wanted to pause here because communities, there are communities around the country that are really grappling with the challenge of single family zoning or single unit zoning, uh, you know, inside, for example, Minneapolis. Minneapolis has uh, replaced single unit zoning with up to triplex zoning. Um, you know, we, we have not done that. Uh, but I have had personally a long standing concern about some of our most intensely used corridors like Georgia Avenue, uh, Veers Mill, you know, University. They're all around the county, um, places that were not intended, you know, the houses were not built to withstand the kind of use that they have today. Um, and as a result, I, th I think there's some real challenges with maintaining uh, that, that kind of housing in that context. Um, and you see a lot of those units. I think those first two on the bottom left are actually law offices or commercial use. I, um, I, th I think the certainly one the first one I think is. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But there's you'll see a lot of law uh, of commercial uses in these single family housing units. Um, and uh, maybe not that one. I don't know. Um, but uh, in any event, um, actually, if you could, well, that's fine. Um, so the recommendation, uh, if you could go back to the overview. The recommendation is for a floating zone for a modest you know, amount of density. I think the more realistic, uh, I don't know what's realistic, but you know, as the property below it develops, there's a possibility of some combination there, you know, that, that could be linked in into one development application or not. You know, maybe the properties won't want to do that. But um, if you could facilitate the redevelopment of the properties on Georgia Avenue, you know, and have them redevelop in a way that has a driveway in the back, like an alley, no longer have to have people turning off and, and turning on from Georgia Avenue, it'd be a big stress relief and safety improvement. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that you could do there. These houses are within walking distance of Forest Glen Metro. So they're, 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 they're both heavily impacted by Georgia Avenue and they are very proximate to the Metro. So I think if, there, if there's really ever a case that the county ought to uh, revise the single unit standard from in, in a place where it's existing. I think it's certainly this is one of them. Um, so I do want to acknowledge, you know, there. I, I believe Tanya is here. She lives on the block. Um, there's there's some criticism of this, no, no, no doubt. Um, and some have said, why why these houses? Why not the other streets that are also single unit zone housing blocks? You know, in that general area. Um, but you know, my my comment there is this is. I think Georgia Avenue is a little different. It's so intense, uh, the use. Um, and I think that, you know, allowing something different there uh, would ultimately result in a better quality housing stock. And, uh, you know, it, it would be a step forward. So we'll pause okay. on this one. <clears throat> Council Member Hawker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, with all due respect to the committee, I. Um, support the idea of um, more housing near the metro the neighborhood uh, you know leadership <coughs> civic association does as well but I have a process concern about this change from the planning board draft because the proposal to uh, impose the floating zone came in so late one of the things and I neglectful by uh, not beginning by complimenting all the planning staff um, and uh, Leslie and Melissa and your whole team on all the outreach that you've done. I think this plan is great. I think one of the things that it um, that has distinguished it from other plans since I've been here is the amount of outreach you've done and the uh, ability that you've shown to pull people together um, in a complicated area um, that is long overdue for redevelopment to get people to unite around a vision of an improved community that um, 
They've, many of them have been waiting for it for a very long time, um, and I think you've done a great job of that. And I think that's reflected in the planning board draft, but then we had, um, you know, very um, uh, active public hearing on the, this and uh, the request to have the floating zone of, um, in this area came in very late in the process and really took a lot of people by surprise. And um, I think, you know, we can get there someday through a better process, uh, not that far from now, but I, I think we would be, we'd have more public confidence in this process and in the plan going forward if we reverted back to the planning board draft. And so I would, I would move to do that. <clears throat> Council Member Friedson. Thank you for that. I echo the compliments to uh, the planning staff and uh, all of the community engagement that has taken place. I also am respectful of the uh, concerns that have been raised. My view on, on this, uh, echoing the uh, committee chair's uh, comments, uh, one is Georgia Avenue, there's an opportunity for missing middle housing that is uh, directly uh, in proximity to uh, Metro. Uh, the floating zone as a, you know, as the approach that we took, I saw that as the uh, compromise here where a floating zone will require a significant process rather than making a zoning change as a recommendation, which I objected to for the reason of the process and the lack of community input and community involvement. Uh, the implementation of a floating zone here uh, allows in the future for exactly the type of process that I think uh, Council Member Hucker has uh, mentioned here, which provides three opportunities uh, through our process for the public to weigh in to determine uh, what this uh, should and could look like and uh, doesn't allow this to happen by right, which I do think would be uh, a problem. So uh, I saw this as the compromised version. Originally, the request came in for a zoning change. I didn't think that the zoning change was the appropriate way uh, to handle this for the reasons stated by Council Member Hucker. I think that a floating zone is an opportunity <laughs> Uh, to uh, address the, the, the whole area of all of the uh, single family uh, homes here. Many of them are businesses actually currently, uh, particularly the ones on Georgia Avenue. They're not uh, single family homes based on the uh, walk that we did there. And I, I think that this provides a balance of a policy goal that we would want uh, and an opportunity uh, for a process and for the public to be able to weigh in uh, as they should in a moderate, kind of modest proposal of what the zoning change could be in terms of missing middle housing that is, you know, directly adjacent uh, or actually abutting a, uh, you know, commercial property uh, here. So uh, that that's the, the, you know, the way that I viewed it. I'm respectful of the viewpoint of the, the district council member and some of the uh, concerns that came in. I think that we uh, moved in that direction with, with the recommendation uh, that we put forward. Uh, and you know, I think this allows for the public to still have their uh, uh, opportunity to, to, to do that moving forward. And I will say there was also a question of whether or not we would treat the two parcels that are being requested for a rezoning. We didn't do the rezoning. We also didn't do just the two parcels because I didn't think that was appropriate either. It's either an area that's appropriate for a floating zone for missing middle housing potentially or it's not. And so that's why we treated it that way at the committee. Uh, Council Member Hawker did make a motion. Is there a second for his motion? Any question? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just to clarify, so if you can zoom out a little bit so I can see the whole lot real quick. So we have, okay, so the wooded area adjacent to the parking lot. So the floating zone that was proposed was for the entire lot, or is it for just the wooded area? It's not the wooded area. It's all of the houses north of the wooded area up to uh, Tilton Drive. What is the wooded area? That's owned by the medical center property. So it is being rezoned to a CRT zone with a 2.5 FA. So presumably the, um, that particular property along with the wooded area could yield some missing middle housing, presumably. If they were to combine properties with the neighboring property owner, right? The wooded area is not owned along, by the same people. If, if they the combine it with the property where the medical building is, for example. Um, so, I'm just trying to understand why 
what was the need to then include these single family homes in that floating zone? First, Is it possible to just do the floating zone and not disturb? <clears throat> I mean, you know, <laughs> I have issues with this notion of, I understand that we have to maximize and I'm all for it. But I also have to think about, you know, being respectful of folks who have purchased their homes and now we're saying, well, your home type is not quite, you know, desirable. And, you know, to me, that's kind of like a judgment call, especially when we have some options. So I'm trying to understand why couldn't we do the floating zone to maximize, you know, the, clo the proximity to Metro and understanding that we could yield some missing middle, but not necessarily disturb folks who are, you know, there. I understand the commercial, you know, nature of it, and that's kind of a hard thing to figure out, but there are some, you know, people who are on, uh, what was that, the street that is parallel to Georgia there, Woodland, Woodland. Mm -hmm. um, they just have their homes there, and then now you have this prospect of this floating zone, you know, um, so anyway, I, I don't know if that's something that the district council member thought about in terms of just maybe limiting the, 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 line, I guess, the boundary of where the floating zone should be, because um, I, I would support something like that. Um, so what's before you is the floating zone either on just the two properties that border the wooded area, because the right. wooded area is already going to be rezoned to mixed use, <clears throat> or rezoning all of the houses. Well, the if line. the wooded area is already going to be rezoned in this property, then I would yes. just say, fine, do that. But I, I, I don't feel comfortable uh, imposing a floating zone on folks on who aren't, right? So in that case, if that's your Council Member Hunter's proposal, then I'll second it. Are you seconding it? Yeah. Yep, okay. <clears throat> it's been moved and seconded. But let me ask you something. Just yes. so if it's a floating zone, it still ha so it has to meet the compatibility um, uh, criteria. Correct. It's, it's not Euclidean, so it's compa So if, to me, Georgia Avenue was very, very different than Woodland Drive, than Woodland yes. uh, Road. <clears throat> and so if, if the floating zone came in, if it was, if it was, it would not be part of the comprehensive rezoning, right? right? right. So each house uh, on whatever side would have to prove compatibility mm -hmm. with the area. And, and that's very different to me than what's on Georgia Avenue than what's on Woodland. Right. And not only would they have to prove um, show compatibility, they would have a, a three-step process, as Councilmember Friedson mentioned. They need a recommendation from planning board. They then go to the hearing examiner. They need a recommendation from the hearing examiner. And the council will then hold a hearing, and the council gets to make the decision on the rezoning. Um, and, and there's no knowing if all of those properties will find one property owner that wants to bring them all in together under one application, or they'll come in piecemeal. I mean, those are the things it's... You know, it's a potential that it's out there, but it doesn't necessarily change anything quickly. But. That's the, the point on this. Councilmember Reamer, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets back to the COG resolution and the need for us to be a little more bold and a little more creative in trying to meet our housing goals. Um, and, you know, I think we're going to have to tackle this issue around the county of uh, every opportunity we have. Um, a floating zone does not mean that it will happen, you know, um, it just creates a possibility and homeowners who don't want to participate in it do not have to. Um, and it might be that those on Woodland Avenue would say thanks but no thanks, you know. Uh, you could certainly imagine that and maybe those on Georgia Avenue would say the same. You know, we don't really know. But at least now, if, if we were to enact the floating zone, there is a, there is a possibility. So. Um, one possibility is that the you know the medical center building owner will approach them and and say we'd like to think a little bigger here and combine and and do something you know would you be interested in selling um and presumably those individuals would be able to sell the property for more than they could sell it otherwise uh, i suppose that is a you know that is one path i don't know if that's what or one of the homeowners might decide I'll redevelop my own house. I'm going to build a duplex. I'm going to build a triplex. Or I, I own two of these houses, and I'm going to combine them. You know, all of these are different possibilities. We don't really know what would happen. Um, but uh, I think in this location, as you stand at that corner, you know, stand on that block, you can see the, you know, you, you, you're within, it's not a stone's throw, but you're, you're pretty close to the Forest Glen Metro, uh, and you're right on 
a very intense road. And I think uh, there's a, just a really strong case here to be a little bit, uh, to you know, take a different approach. Councilmember uh, Rice. Thank you very much, Council President. So, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. With the floating zone designation, it doesn't mean as though you're required to do anything. It gives the homeowner an option. And so it actually gives more flexibility than they currently have now to decide what it is that they want to do. And from that perspective, I've always felt as though giving more options to homeowners is better for them in that sense, um, providing them more flexibility to decide what they want to do, whether it's currently with some of them utilizing their home as a business or their property as a business, uh, especially when it's forward facing to a major state road uh, like uh, 97 that is directly across the street from a major metro stop. You know, and I say major because the reality is is that we've seen the growth and the ridership increase at Forest uh, Metro so much so that we're talking about a bridge going across to help support it. So, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we have to keep in mind and remember. So from that perspective, I mean, it, to me it seems as though, again, the flexibility piece, uh, which isn't restricting anyone or forcing anyone to do anything, it's just giving a property owner more flexibility. Now, I am sensitive to the folks that are on the backside <laughs> that are in the other homes, and certainly from that perspective, that's certainly something that warrants a lot of discussion. But again, in terms of their application, they would still have to go through you in terms of saying what would make sense for us in being a buffer when it comes to this and the existing neighborhood that's behind it. Is that not correct? So I, so I still feel comfortable with, again, giving flexibility to residents and their properties that are, uh, that are abutting this major road thoroughfare and across the street from a uh, major metro station makes complete sense to me. Council Vice President Hucker. Again, I think the concern is the process here. We're all for missing middle housing. Uh, however, um, I think it needs to be done in a way that doesn't create a lot of uh, concern and uh, distrust <coughs> in the community. If we're talking about in this community in particular, we have a civic association, the leadership of which has worked very well with this council and is very pro this plan and very pro <coughs> housing and very pro TOD in general. And in this one narrow area, because of the concerns of the homeowners, right in that area who were affected by this sort of end around, around the process and the very late-breaking request uh, to, uh, to change the planning board draft, the committee <coughs> came out and amended the planning board draft. I think the planners did a great job. They took all the, everything that's been said uh, into consideration. They landed somewhere else. And I think in re respect to the immediate community, the Civic Association, and the planning board, um, you know, that's, I'm more comfortable um, reverting back to their draft and allowing us to move forward in the future through a more transparent process. There are many residential areas <coughs> close to Metro, including at Tacoma Park, where no one's proposing a floating zone over the objection of the neighbors there. Um, and I don't think we should here either. Council Member Navarro. Thank you. Again, to clarify, so the, the houses that are facing Georgia Avenue, um, those right now, you were saying those are commercial? Well, I honestly you don't know. You said if something they about they're like a medical or, or something? Okay, because I, I know you were, I'm sorry, <laughs> when you were doing the street view, I thought that you were doing that in order to show that apparently the ones that are in the corner there were some kind of. They're zoned, so they're, they're zoned residential, but some may have home businesses home or businesses home offices. offices in okay. them. They have not been zoned commercial. Right. They right. may have home businesses. Got it. Councilmember Remo. Okay, uh, I just want to make one observation. I, I understand the concern or the frustration about the council's change of the plan. Um, but it, I do want to uh, be clear that this is the process. This is not, you know, I, I totally understand Councilmember Hucker's commentary here and where he's coming from. I do want to push back on one phrase, though. This was not an end run around the process. 
the county council is the authority. We request draft plans from our planning department and they provide that important function. But we make substantial changes to master plans at the county council. I can think of just for example, the Bethesda sector plan. The staff presented one version of that plan. The planning board practically rewrote it. And then the county council practically rewrote it again. Uh, that is the process. That's not an end run around the process. That is the process. Uh, so in this case, the challenge is that the planning board does not have really in, in the view of the planning board, uh, the allowance to recommend uh, changing single family zoning to something different because the general plan doesn't call for that. At least that has been said to me in the past from planning staff. And so, you know, I don't know why it wasn't recommended in this plan. It could have been. I just don't know that it was on the radar. But, you know, we, 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 we discussed it publicly at committee. We're discussing it here today. I, I think that is, you know, satisfactory. Uh, as far as far as public awareness <clears throat> and involvement is concerned, um, and the alternative is for us not to be able to make changes and and revise plans. Um, you know, I don't know what we would have done in the Bethesda sector plan if, in order to rewrite the plan from the county council's view, we had to go back through the process all over again. Uh, we'd still be working on it. So. You know, there are practical limitations on it as well. Council Member Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a few just cl clarifying questions. The Sherwood Forest or whatever we're calling it, the wooded, the wooded acres, well, it's, Sherwood, it's perpendicular to Sherwood, Sherwood Road, so it is Sherwood Forest. Sherwood is, Forest. Is 1.24 acres. Um, the collection of the single family homes to the north of that, what is that size? What, what, how much? There how many are acres? 60, is that what you're asking? What? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, acreage. Something. What is that acreage? Not oh. what it's zoned for. The single family homes that are currently zoned are 60. If you took them all together, it's about 1.8 acres. Okay, 1.8 acres. Okay. Thank you for that. And so, Ms. Dunn, uh, lots of questions about process, and I just want to understand this. If the council approves a floating zone for the 1.8 acres, what is, what are the next steps of the process? Uh, for any of those property owners that are under that floating zone, they will have to make an application for rezoning to actually access the zone that exists under that floating zone. So to get that CRN of 1.5, uh, we call it a CRNF for floating, they have to apply for that. They'd go to the planning department and put in an application. It also goes to the hearing examiner, gets reviewed by planning staff. They take a staff report to the planning board where the applicant can come and speak, the neighbors can come and speak, the planning board after listening makes a recommendation to the hearing examiner, hearing examiner holds a public hearing on it, again public process people can come and speak, um, the hearing examiner then makes their decision, which is a recommendation to the council who's the only body that can change the zoning and so then it would be before this council with a public hearing to decide is it an appropriate change in zoning, the application that's come forward. But one property owner can come forward, Five property owners can come forward. It's we don't really know. And so the decision that we're discussing right now, the decision yeah. before so us, is to whether or not to allow a floating zone, which does not change the zoning. Ultimately, if a property owner goes through those three or four different steps, the council then would need to approve or dis disapprove Correct. any zoning changes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. Can can I ask for the yes. for the of the properties that are associated in the 1.8 acres, and I don't know how many are there. I guess a half a dozen or so. 
Did any of the property owners request this floating zone, or did how, how many of the property, property owners? One property owner came forward and requested it. It's, it's the property owner that owns the two properties that are back to back that border the that forest. One that has something on Georgia Avenue and, and one on Wood. Oh, well, right. The two rental properties owned by one property owner. That was the request. Did anyone contact the other property owners to ask what their opinion was? Um, no, because it came at the public hearing. And it came actually, I mean, to be fair, it came as a request for rezoning, not for a floating zone. It was through the committee conversations and recommendation to the committee that the floating zone was picked as, pro as the path to take because um, it wouldn't change the zoning on the properties today. I understand. And now, would, would it change the assessments on the property if you did get a floating zone? It, it, the only time the assessments change is if the zone itself is changed. Correct. Um, and. Um, is it so there is a possibility that the actual property owners the people that own these houses have no idea that we're discussing their own homes today correct okay council member vice president hopper um i think you've uh stumbled is the wrong word but right on to the point mr president stumbled is a good word whenever you're talking about me but go ahead <laughs> um no like a laser um <laughs> that is the point is that the property owner of these two rental properties the end run I was referring to, um, the property owner, my understanding is, doesn't live in the community, didn't go to the multiple well-attended community meetings where there were there was vigorous debate on both sides about the future of the community and the process. I'm well aware of the, the, um, um, <clears throat> the process here and the fact that the council has the final say. But um, for a property owner who doesn't live in the community to skip all the steps uh, where they can engage their neighbors and the people directly affected by it and then come in at the hearing um, with counsel and make this request and then the committee to overrule the planning commission to do this I think is is uh, regrettable and that's why I made the motion to revert to the planning board draft um, we could we could get to this same goal through a better process that makes the community happier and more confident in our leadership um, by just taking a different path today, and that's what I'd suggest we do. Thank you very much, Councilmember Navarro. Yeah, I'll be brief. I don't want to belabor the point. I think I can count, but um, I want to just say that you know I was very excited earlier <laughs> about the fact that we want to maximize public-owned properties, and I think that we have a lot of opportunities where we can really push the envelope. I do worry about the fact that we will be faced with a lot of decisions regarding neighborhoods, and to just you know go all the way in like this, and in many ways, in my perspective, you know disrespect the fact that some of these property owners don't even know we're having this conversation sets up not a very good climate right. for what we're going to have to be doing in the future, which will call for some bold decisions. So all I'm saying is, you know, to, to, to say that somehow we're not, you know, staying true in some way to the COG resolution, I think we are and we're showing it right here and we will continue to do that. And what Councilman Friedson said earlier, you know, it is very true. We've missed a lot of opportunities, in my opinion, because we didn't really have like a comprehensive sort of goal that we can, you know, wrap our heads around. So we're trying to do that and we're doing it with this Dennis Avenue property and that's really exciting and some of these multifamily, you know, that's awesome. But again, you know, we need to weigh that with the trust that the community has in us and I think that, to me, the, the, the juice is not, you know, worth the squeeze, especially because of what we're going to have to continue to do. So that's why I supported the, the uh, amendment. Okay. Uh, Council Member Reamer, and Council Member Reamer just whispered to me before, I think we're going to put a bookmark in it at this point, right after we make this, this decision. Uh, you're about halfway through your packet, as close as I can tell, Pam. And, Correct. And I know that we that um, that uh, Dr. Orland has another several, well, couple, 15 minutes or whatever from his. So we're, we're going to, at, at, after we make this, uh, go through this part, then we're going to put a uh, bookmark in it and we'll come back. But Council Member Reamer, please. Thank you. Uh, good discussion and entirely reasonable points on all sides here. I, I, I just think we need to begin the work of, uh, uh, of changing our approach and, and thinking differently about how we have zoned the county. And uh, I think this is a, a highly appropriate location uh, to make this kind of change. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, at the end of the day, what matters is, is this a good idea or, or not a good idea? And I think it is a fine idea and it might well produce some, some very positive outcomes 
Um, and so I really uh, encourage my colleagues to support it. But I think we've got to we got to get working on this bigger issue here of uh, of zoning uh, and the the many places in this county where you can see single unit zoning um, literally across the street from Metro. And this is this is one of them. All right, we have a, um, a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Restate the motion. The motion. Well, you want to restate it as, as it is today? It's your motion. Uh, so. it was, it was, yes. Go ahead. Put it, yeah. to, to revert back to the planning board recommendation with the friendly amendment suggested by Councilwoman Navarro. Okay. Is it clear with everybody what the motion is? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And that is three of us. That is Councilmember Hawker, Councilmember Navarro, and myself. Those opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. And that is five. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to put the bookmark in right now. Thank you. And we'll come back to this. We'll have to figure out when we're coming back to this and schedule it. But uh, that is where we are today. We do have two other items. Yep. Uh, after right now, and, this, and the uh, next one is uh, the action item on a corrective map amendment, uh, H-130 for Tacoma Park Master Plan. Ms. Dunn gets to stay here Yay. with us because that's <laughs> one of her uh, items. And you. You can stay too, Casey. Um, yes, so you have before you a corrective map amendment. Um, this occurred uh, over a long time ago. Um, we had WSSC grid maps when they were placed together. Sometimes the boundary lines did not match up. Sometimes the zoning then that got translated from those maps did not meet the right boundary lines for properties um, or for plats. Um, this one has been exceedingly complicated, um, but has been reviewed for many, many hours by park and planning and by council staff. Uh, we met on it and we reviewed it multiple times actually. So it is one of the more complicated corrective map amendments that I have seen, but I feel confident that it is accurate. And so what it implements is the zoning that the master plan recommended for these properties. Um, and that was the goal of the correction, is to make sure that when master plans are approved by the council and they recommend zoning, that it gets placed accurately. And so really what this represents, and if you want to turn to you know, circle two and three, you'll see they are to the thousandth of an acre accuracy on China, what we're trying to change here, which are really tiny little bits and pieces of property to make sure they're right. Um, but they take some from being R60 to being CRT, some from NR to R60. Um, it was just a complete cleanup. Um, I think there are good maps um, in the back on circle, it looks like 15. Again, it's some of the colors unfortunately don't come out that great um, when we reproduce these. Um, but if you have any questions about them, I can talk about it in more detail. But really, it is about correcting um, some in accurately drawn zoning lines. I see no lights on up here for questions. Okay. So We didn't get any testimony as well. It's and this is a roll call vote, right? Mr. Glass? Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Reamer? Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Mr. Varro? Yes. Mr. Varro votes yes. Mr. Albernos? Yes. Mr. Albernos votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Friedson? Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. So it is unanimous by those present. And then the last thing we're going to mention today, other than the word adjourn, is um, an introduction. We're going to have zo a zoning text amendment 20 02 accessory structured standards which is the uh, lead sponsors are Councilmember Friedson and Councilmember Jawando, and there's a public hearing scheduled for March the 3rd at 1.30 p.m. Thank you for being with us. We are adjourned. <laughs>